Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar. The subject of the evolution from the single buyer to the electricity market and the value of traders. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. I'll be posting a presenter biographies for you in the Zoom chat facility to save time in reading these out. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation today. For information, we have about 1,900 delegates registered to attend this webinar today uh, to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. And this really attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as to the stature of our presenters today. May I therefore express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort that they've put in. Mm -hmm. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who have registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, ESKIM is currently structured as a vertically integrated electricity utility encompassing generation, transmission and distribution. However, there are far reaching plans to restructure the electricity supply industry to comprise a diversified competitive generation sector, an independent transmission system operator, and an independent market operator. Uh, together with a electricity capacity and ancillary services market and electricity trading and distribution as a sector. Already, there's been a move away from the monopoly power generation utility to the single buyer model, where in addition to its own dominant uh, power generation activities, ESKIM procures energy and capacity from independent power producers. This was followed by the emergence of one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many -many wheeling arrangements, using the ESKIM grid as the platform, connecting independent electricity generators to off-takers. More recently, we have seen the emergence of third-party traders who procure electricity from one or more IPPs using ESKIM and the municipal networks and selling to a number of off-takers in the mining, industrial, manufacturing, and commercial sectors. And in due course, this may even extend down to retail energy trading at the domestic customer level. Ultimately, these are all pathways towards a liberalized electricity supply industry where a diversified range of large, medium, and small generators and prosumers supply electricity into the electricity grid based on economic principles through power purchase agreements, bilateral and multilateral contracts, traders, and electricity markets to customers connected to the grid and to distribution networks. So this webinar will focus on the emergence of electricity traders, highlighting the value adding role they play and the mechanisms they use in facilitating uh, optimization of the electricity grid, uh, diversification of electricity supply options, mitigation of risk and improvement of the terms of power uh, purchase agreements. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's now my pleasure to try and introduce you to Mondi Bala, the head of ESKIM Distribution, to officially open this webinar. Now, we've been having some serious bandwidth problems as a result of cable failures, international cable failures uh, around uh, the world and around uh, South Africa in particular. And so we may be having uh, some connectivity issues, but we're going to give it a try and we're going to do our best. Uh, if we cannot connect with Mondi, we'll try moving on uh, to uh, Eskom, to Onika uh, Rantwane, 
Uh, and uh, if we still have problems, we'll move on to our other presenters one by one. So it's a great pleasure for me to see if I can introduce you to uh, uh, Mondi. Uh, I'm just looking uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the system to see whether he has connected or not. I know he's been having problems connecting. So if you can just bear with me uh, one second uh, whilst I have a look to see if he's logged in. No, I, I see that he hasn't logged in at the moment. So with that, I'm going to move over to Onika uh, and to uh, introduce Onika uh, as our first uh, presenter. So Onika, if you could be so kind as to switch on your camera and get ready to uh, give your presentation. I see your cameras on uh, uh, Onika, if you can switch on your microphone and try and share your presentation and let's see how this goes. But while uh, Onika is bringing on her presentation, uh, may I say that she's a seasoned electricity pricing advisor with more than 15 years of experience uh, at ESCOM. Uh, she's responsible for development of electricity pricing policies, including wheeling and net billing, as well as design and modeling of ESCOM tariffs. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to um, uh, Onika. Onika, we can see your presentation. May I suggest that you switch off your camera at this point in order to uh, improve bandwidth? And over to you now, if you can switch off your camera and give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, and uh, good afternoon to all the attendees in this very important uh, discussion on the future developments in the energy sector. I was expecting that the distribution group executive would have provided insights into the future ESCOM distribution model. And therefore my focus for the presentation will be on one of the interventions uh, that he would have provided inputs on, which is virtual wheeling. So I'm still hoping that uh, the distribution group executive is able to join us. There are exciting products uh, in the distribution industry that we would like to share uh, with the energy industry as a whole. So as I said, uh, program director, my focus for this is on virtual wheeling. And this is really a catalyst in enabling private sector participation to provide the much needed additional generation capacity onto the grid. And we believe that it's also a product that will demonstrate the significant uh, impact uh, that is, um, you know, and, and value that the electricity energy traders provide in the industry, which is the optimization of supply and demand. So colleagues, I think we know that the country we are undergoing an energy transition we have now moved from a single buyer vertically integrated utility model to a multi-market model where the private generators are now able to participate and you know, be on a competitive level with ESCOM generation. So as a result of that, there has been an increased interest in, in willing of energy between private generators and buyers through bilateral agreements. This has been uh, made possible by various interventions that are undertaken to tackle the country's energy crisis. And particularly with regards to this is the amendments to schedule two of the Electricity Regulation Act to remove the generation licensing threshold for private generators. So William of Energy has been identified as really a catalyst um, between, and a crucial link between the sellers and buyers of electricity. We are aware um, that ESCOM has had a willing framework for more than a decade now, since about 2009. There is, um, I believe, a, a fair level of understanding of the willing framework. It's been applied. We already have uh, customers and generators that are willing through the ESCOM network and supplying energy to their off-takers in other, in other areas. And that is really the, the, the benefit of willing because it enables the generators to, to generate where the renewable energy sources are located and, and supply the end users in other locations. So the problem with uh, this model is that it's been 
traditionally we, we know that it, it's, it's, it relies on measuring what the generator produces and then we do what we call a reconciliation on the off-takers bill to credit that uh, the wilt energy. And this obviously requires um, amendments to supply agreements that the off-takers would have with ESCOM. So uh, program director, there is limitations with this traditional uh, William framework. Um, and maybe to explain this, I will just use a, 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 a scenario for the participants to understand what the limitations are. So now imagine that you've got, you've got a, a, a corporate entity, it could be a retail entity, in South Africa, the, this company has a store or a number of stores in every town in South Africa. Some of these stores are supplied directly from ESCOM and some are supplied by the municipalities. Now, imagine that this is one of the companies that has got decarbonization targets. They need to be 100% green by say 2035, whatever the case. You would agree with me Chair, that um, to try and for, for this uh, company to try and source renewable energy to all their points of supply. And this could be thousands of ports across South Africa. Uh, to try and do this using the traditional um, wheeling approach would be a, a nightmare. So that is really the, the limitation of, of, of the traditional wheeling approach that it doesn't cater for that multiple generator to multiple off-taker kind of a willing transaction. And obviously does not adequately address uh, customers that are beyond the municipalities, because as we know that the, the currently it's only limited to municipalities that have willing frameworks in place. And we know that not all the municipalities have got a willing framework. Some are only starting uh, to introduce willing in their municipalities. So uh, what then is next? Um, we have the industry has knocked on our doors uh, to explain this predicament and as, as come we listened. So that's then uh, the discussions with the industry then gave um, birth to this concept, which we are very interested about. It's a new concept called virtual wheeling. Um, it's a product that is currently under development by ESCOM. And this is where we believe that the value of traders will really be demonstrated because this is where the traders are going to play a crucial role in making sure that the aggregation between the sellers and the buyers is done. So, the, the, the virtual willing policy has been uh, approved as a concept. We are now in the process of developing this um, to make sure that we, we can um, officially roll it out to the industry. Just to explain uh, a bit on what it is and where is it applicable, uh, it will be applicable where you've got one or more generators, if, as I've described in the in the scenario that I used as an example. So that um, retail entity that has got multiple ports across South Africa will have um, a trader, or they could do this as as you know as a corporate entity. So we've got the buyer; it could be a customer, a trader, or a corporate entity. And what happens then is that the data from the off-takers and generators will be aggregated by this energy trader and a refund is provided for the wheeled energy on a consolidated basis. So the important distinction between the two, uh, the traditional and virtual wheeling, and I will be going through this in the next slide as well. But um, I think the important distinction is that uh, we do the same in terms of measuring what the generator or the generators are exporting onto the grid. So this still relies on the generators being connected uh, to the ESCOM grid. But unlike traditional wheeling approach, where the credit is, is provided to the individual accounts, in this case, with the virtual wheeling approach, we will be providing the credits uh, to as a single refund to the buyer or the aggregator 
trader, etc. The important thing uh, to realize is that the basis of this refund is that the individual customers are going to be paying their electricity bills in full on a monthly basis. And therefore, um, in ESCOM is overcharged the, the individual accounts because we would have charged the customer for the full energy that is produced by ESCOM as well as the energy that was produced by the private generator. And therefore, we need to then refund the buyer for the energy that was not produced by ESCOM generation, but rather by the private generators. So just to illustrate, and I know this is a very busy slide, but um, I actually like it because it explains um, very well this virtual wheeling uh, platform uh, to, the, to, to, to the users. And what happens is that you will have a buyer, let's say you've got a trading company and they have PPAs with different generators or sellers. What will happen is that this different generators well, uh, the buyer will aggregate the, the, the generation profile from all the generators as well as um, what will be sold to each of the buyers. And this will need to be done in what we call a buyer's platform. So each and every trader will need to be uh, in accordance with um, the requirements by ESCOM needs to have this platform that will interface with the ESCOM aggregation platform where we will be able to then uh, do the settlements. The important thing, and this is just to reiterate the point, is that the off-takers um, in this uh, virtual wheeling transaction could be anywhere in South Africa. So they could be uh, placed um, directly supplied by ESCOM or it, they could be supplied by municipalities. But um, the most important thing is that they would still need to pay their normal accounts uh, to ESCOM or to municipalities, depending on where they are connected. And we don't do any refunds on the individual account. So based on this um, aggregated data between the buyers and the seller, there is now a settlement. We will calculate what, um, what energy was willed and not um, produced by ESCOM generation and that will be refunded uh, to, to the buyer. So then I think the question could be, what, what is then the difference between the traditional willing approach and the virtual willing approach? And I just try to indicate at very high level, the main differences based on what um, the traditional willing model does. So as we know that, as I said, with the traditional wheeling model, you've got usually one generator wheeling to one or few of takers and under the virtual wheeling platform, this enables us to now expand to allow multiple generators to wheel to multiple of takers. With the traditional wheeling approach, the credits are provided to the of taker as we know, but um, with virtual, it will be provided to the energy traders or, or aggregators, the buyer of the energy. We currently contract with individual off-takers. So it's, it's the customers that have got electricity supply agreements with ESCOM under the traditional wheeling, but with virtual wheeling, there is um, no requirement for us to do that. We will contract directly with the energy trader or the buyer and there's no need for amendments to electricity supply agreements of off takers, because as we said, we do not affect any credits um, for wheeled energy to the buyer, I mean, to the off taker. And in case of municipalities, as uh, most of the audience are already aware that there has been really challenges with um, the updates of some of the electricity supply agreements, of the municipalities if the off-taker is, is located within a municipal area of supply. So with virtual wheeling, because we are not impacting um, the municipal revenue at all, there is no need for us to um, amend the, the ESA as we do not provide 
the credit directly to the Munich, but we do it to the buyer. And just to touch on what remains the same between the two, we've got uh, the credit rate for willing that, that will remain. Um, so the same rate that we credit on under traditional willing will still be the same rate that we use for virtual willing. The energy credits is still kept to the total consumption. So that rule still applies. And um, if there is surplus energy that can be sold to another third party or under the ESCOM standard offer, which is, uh, I believe the industry is now aware of. And we also have the administration charge that will be raised to cover the cost of wheeling. So uh, Chair, just to touch on some of the future developments in this um, space, we believe that we still require the national free wheeling framework as an industry. And this is to ensure that there is standardized wheeling approach across all distributors. And um, obviously this will address the principles on credit mechanisms and the use of system charges. Uh, so we need that for means both municipalities and ESCOM to work from the same principles. There is work uh, that um, is undertaken under the NECOM and to, to try and assist the industry with developing this national William framework. And we believe that it will be one of the, 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 the crucial legislation or, or, or document as a framework to assist the industry with, um, with willing. Then there is obviously inter-distributor willing evolution that we are seeing most um, uh, developers and energy traders inquiring about. And this is, for example, where you've got um, a generator in one municipality that wants to wheel energy to an, a customer that is located in a different municipality or even in an ESCOM area of supply. We currently do not have um, regulations related to that, and we believe that needs to be clarified. Then the very last uh, one, which is very crucial as well for all the distributors, that is ESCOM in, in municipalities, is that we need to include um, generators in our cost of supply studies um, to, to be able to derive appropriate use of system charges. And this is very important because we need to provide certainty to, to the industry as they develop their PPAs um, between the, the sellers and the buyers. So in conclusion, Chair, I would really like to thank the EE Business Intelligence and your partners to, for arranging this crucial platform where we meet um, as energy industry to discuss the developments that are taking place in the sector. And I believe that with uh, efficient collaboration amongst all the road players, we can together achieve a sustainable, robust and resilient electricity supply industry to rebuild investor confidence and ensure economic sustainability for our country. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Onika. And I must say, I personally find this a very exciting development, the concept of virtual wheeling and virtual trading, because it effectively takes the municipality out of the picture in respect of the transaction. Uh, it leaves the wires and the connection to the uh, uh, off taker, you know, in exactly the same state as it was. It means that people will still get their municipal bill. They will still pay for their municipal bill in the normal way. Municipalities, as I understand it, Annika, don't have to change their billing system. Uh, in fact, they don't have to do anything. In fact, they don't even have to, as I, as I can see it, don't even have to know that there is a trading relationship with an off-taker. Uh, it's now a transaction uh, uh, really between the trader and the off-taker. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, in fact, the, 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 the off-taker gets a rebate or a refund from the trader uh, and not from ESCOM um, and not from the generator, uh, but from the trader. And it, 
it just means that we don't have to worry about wheeling agreements through the municipal network uh, because that process stays exactly as it is. Uh, am I right in understanding that, Onika? You are correct, uh, Chris, and I think you've interpreted it very well. Um, this is, um, you know, one of the areas where we're trying to to address these limitations, as you're saying. You know, it's 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 been very difficult. It's been a long journey uh, with um, the various off takers, especially where the off takers are located within municipalities. There's been issues about uh, Munich uh, debt and and deposits, and um, you know. Uh, and obviously municipalities having to update their deposit before we can even allow a willing transaction. But with virtual willing, there's no need for us to touch the electricity supply agreement of the municipality. So you are correct. Thank you. That's a really interesting. And the municipal metering stays the same. The municipal billing stays the same. The contract between the off taker and the municipality stays the same. It, for me, is a very exciting development. And thank you very much, Anika, uh, for your presentation. It's highly appreciated. And I think it's a very welcome introduction uh, to <coughs> the rest of this webinar. So if I may ask you to now switch off your camera, and we will now move to our next presenter, uh, which uh, is Holger Janke. Uh, Holger uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of the independent power pool. I see that he has switched on his camera and he's uh, sharing his presentation now. We can see that perfectly uh, now, Holger. Uh, but a quick introduction to Holger. He over, has over 20 years experience in the energy sector with a decade of experience in the South African renewable energy market. And he was the architect of uh, Africa's first uh, renewable energy bond and one of the founders of the independent energy pool. Uh, the balance of his um, biography can be uh, found in the chat program where we have shared a link uh, to download the, 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 the biographies of all the presenters. So in the interest of time, we're going to move directly on to Holger now and uh, over to you, Holger, with your presentation. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Chris. Um, and uh, I would like to take the opportunity here uh, to congratulate ESCOM and Annika for setting up this virtual wheeling. It is going to be a game changer in the market. So, but um, let me um, take you through a quick presentation, which will focus after a short introduction on IEP around uh, the topic of deregulation, what um, the private electricity markets potentials are in South Africa, and also um, what roles a marketplace would play in a deregulated environment. So, IEP um, is effectively a business-to-business -business energy pool, which allows generators, off-takers, and traders uh, to buy and sell electricity. It does that in a um, certain way. It's a harmonized, balanced, uh, standardized environment that allows actually to transact efficiently electricity. Uh, the team of IEP consists of uh, eight experts out of the electricity industry, a combined uh, experience of 100 years, and uh, individually and collectively, um, the team has accomplished a number of firsts um, in the Southern African arena, notably in the financial, in the mining, the hydrogen, and also the renewable energy space. The team is backed by a substantial team of uh, technical experts, IT developers, uh, actuaries that assist IP in building its platform. It's a proprietary platform. Um, that has a specific architecture that serves um, the trading of electricity uh, on a level that is comparable with, um, with uh, the financial services sector. The services that IP offers are a hosting of the marketplace, which effectively allows the trading um, of electricity or the buying and selling of electricity in a standardized contract structure. There are a number of products available for that. And because of that, it allows the buyer and the seller to focus on the commercial terms. And then it can be as simple as that. It's effectively, um, when do you need energy? Uh, for how long do you need it? What is the quantity of the energy you require? And what's the price? And electricity buying and selling should be as simple as that. And we offer a balanced risk environment in which that can take place. 
Um, we offer procurement services that are digital and auditable. So because of the digital nature, they can be extremely rapid. Door-to-door uh, -door closure of a PPA would be under three months. And a lot of things, a lot of times people forget the fact that after closing of a PPA, you need to execute the uh, electricity supply services. So the whole topic of metering, um, billing, reconciliation, treasury management has to be taken care of. That's what we provide and also the reporting element. Last not least, uh, change in law is an, uh, it's an overarching topic. We will experience that. We provide a process that allows actually um, you know, transactions or group of transactions to go through that process. So um, moving on to the question of um, what are the opportunities in South Africa in the next 10 years for the private electricity sector? And this is a bit of um, crystal ball um, material, but, you know, let's look at the general trends. So uh, we, we all know that there's going to be a decommissioning process of the fossil fire power plants um, that ESCOM has in its portfolio, uh, which will create a gap between uh, demand and supply. Um, there is an influx of new energy consumption requirements that generally um, are a bit underestimated in the media to our um, uh, taste. Um, EV um, will play a huge role in terms of energy consumption. You move away from, you know, the gas station providing diesel over to electricity charged vehicles, and that amount of energy will be quite substantial. In addition to that, you have a very fast evolving hydrogen market um, that has seen a tremendous influx of uh, projects and projects being developed in that space because of the resource renew uh, the renewal resource advantages of South Africa. So all in all, we estimate that by 2033, uh, there's a total requirement of 80 gigawatts of uh, consumption in South Africa. And we believe that the gap at that time, you know, if nobody does anything will be 30 gigawatts. 30 gigawatts of constant power supply, which equates then effectively um, in a solar and uh, wind mix to 60 gigawatts of capacity that would need to be installed. Now, the topic of pricing comes up quite open, often in the discussions. Um, it's obviously you know, a mixed bag of parameters, but I think it, it, you can summarize the situation about uh, generation costs and levelized cost of generation to a very simple equation, which is that because renewable energy resources don't depend on fuel supply agreements anymore, it is actually down to uh, what is the cost of the installation of an asset. And these costs are mainly driven by, um, by um, the, the global sourcing requirements. And therefore, we believe that in the long run, the price points of levelized cost of electricity generation will converge globally. This will most likely create, uh, irrespective of, um, of the discussions around the ESCOM pricing, to uh, price increases mainly driven by, um, by the, the global sector. So um, just a glimpse at uh, the trend of deregulation uh, globally. Um, deregulation started somewhere in the late 80s and has since then seen actually um, you know, um, quite a development across the globe. I mean, this is only exemplary, but effectively uh, a huge number of uh, countries and states have actually engaged in the deregulation quite successfully bringing down uh, pricing um, of electricity and thereby making the economy um, very or a lot more competitive as opposed to standardized uh, pricing structures that are monolithic in nature. So how does a, um, a deregulated market look like? And this is obviously, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a concept and this concept will have local connotations that, uh, that vary. But there are two underlying principles. Uh, there's one underlying principle that uh, that is um, uh, reflective in in any of the energy markets. There are actually two markets that need to be taken a look at. You've got on the one hand side the commercial transactional markets, i.e., the price finding quantity and price finding mechanisms. That is literally only a commercial environment. And then you have the second market, which is the balancing market, where the effective Flow of funds need to be balanced, and those are totally separate to uh, to be seen. Quite obviously, for balancing, 
um, purposes, uh, the TSOs and DSOs need to procure additional electricity, possibly out of the, the, the commercial markets, but effectively it's a separate environment. Now, if you look at the markets, there may be one, there may be multiple per geography. Um, uh, the, the key players in this, in this market are obviously um, the generators and the off-takers that then meet in that marketplace to buy and sell electricity. That is then further enhanced uh, by traders. Traders uh, have the capability of aggregating either side of the equation to make a value proposition more palatable because at times the one side actually makes a proposal that does not really match the other side and the trader can be actually the missing link in the middle to make sure that uh, consumption and generation uh, meet. So what are the challenges in emerging countries relative to deregulation and setting up actually a market? Um, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the, um, there is this huge gap. Now, 60 gigawatts of renewable energies is a huge, amount, it's a huge number, but there's one underlying, underlying theme. These assets all still need to be built. And that actually means that the off-takers that uh, chat to the generators um, have all of the sudden constraints because the generator says, well, I need to build that asset. And for building the asset, I need to get financing. The financing requires a long off-take agreement. And all of a sudden, the off-taker sits there and says, okay, I need to engage now for 10, 15, or 20 years and whatever the case may be. So that's that constraint. So because there are no assets available, buying and selling of electricity at the current stage is a long-term process and will only get to short-term, um, uh, to a short-term environment the moment that uh, debt is being repaid or the assets are refinanced that allows more flexible trading of electricity. The second constraint quite obviously is the transmission grid. And um, uh, the reason for that is that the transmission grid has been designed for the current setup of the generation assets and the way that they are distributed over the country. And now all of a sudden, um, IPPs actually choose different generation uh, locations, which is a strategic and commercial decision and makes absolute sense in isolation. But quite obviously, you know, the transmission grid hasn't been built for that and cater that. So um, there's no, there, it's, it's commercially attractive to build an asset in the Uppington area when it's solar. Um, but quite obviously, there is no offtake and there's no transmission grid that has been built for, for catering these type of uh, evacuations. So you've got actually the, um, the, the constraint of the upgrade of the transmission grid to cater for this new environment. So what does that effectively mean for the offtaker? Um, well, you, you are in a situation that um, the offtaker needs to all of a sudden um, talk about an energy strategy, how does it consume electricity, um, what's going to be the focus over the next 10, 15 years. It needs to do an assessment of the operations right now. There are demand side management reflections in there. Then it needs to go out to procure the electricity. Uh, the bits that it gets back are not really compliant to what the needs are. So there's a huge risk in terms of actually the procurement process. The generators on the other side, they're sitting there having to match the consumption profile with the generation profile. And obviously the consumer has a certain requirement in terms of electricity generation, but the solar plant only generates electricity during daytime. So the matching of generation and consumption is a substantial constraint and creates issues in terms of finding matches between the parties. Other than that, there are constraints uh, relative to documentation. Uh, you've got bespoke PPAs, which cause a huge problem because um, bespoke PPAs take time in negotiation, which obviously creates issues in terms of bio, um, uh, validity of underlying office on EPC contractors that may lapse and therefore a longer project negotiation process reduces the, 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 the probability of success. On the other hand, once you have a bilateral closed, these two parties are pretty much locked into this arrangement and cannot actually reschedule and rearrange the, um, the, 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 the contract if there are other and better opportunities coming up on both sides. 
Lastly, and this is something that is actually extremely important, I mentioned the fact that transmission grid has been built for a certain setup. We know that the transmission grid has to go through a change. And that's not only a physical change of building new transmission lines and distribution lines, it is also an adoption of the pricing models because the pricing models have been set for this current structure. So the question would be, why would a solar plant being built in, in Springboard have lower connection costs than the power plant being built in the Gauteng area? That under the current model, you know, is the case and, you know, it effectively it doesn't really make sense. So there is a change in the pricing model that needs to be expected that creates actually risk and change of law and that needs to be catered with. So the relevance of the wholesale um, electricity markets in emerging countries is what are the requirements of wholesale markets that actually could possibly bridge the gap? So um, the wholesale markets um, are pretty much the same as in, in, in established economies, except for the fact that it needs to actually stretch the boundaries of their services quite a lot in order to, uh, to accommodate the, the, the current situation. So the gap between uh, offtake now and generation uh, to be built for covering the offtake is actually a huge issue. So markets, wholesale markets need to assist offtakers to assess the viability of generation assets. That contains the topic of permits and licenses, um, as well as the financial viability for the investment case. So that element is to be provided by marketplaces in order to facilitate actually transactions. The second is standardization of BPAs. It is absolutely crucial that the industry aligns itself to standard BPAs and the marketplaces will play an essential role in that process because they are totally impartial and they can talk to any stakeholder in the industry, whether it's the off-taker, whether it's the generator, the trader, the banks, the equity providers, the, all parties need to come together to standardize the documents so that uh, transactions can happen and can happen effectively. Third is the price optimization. It is uh, extremely important to get transparency around pricing and quantities. This doesn't mean that there is a name saying, okay, the generator X is trading with the, um, with the off-taker Y. It is about the volumes and the pricing that is being traded. They, so the names are anonymous, but the transactions are visualized so that people know what the price point are for certain quantities. And lastly, and that's an important element specifically for the DSOs and, and TSOs, um, bilateral agreements that are not managed properly create a huge amount of uh, transaction costs relative to doing the billing, doing the metering, doing the reconciliation, and it will end up being a nightmare for uh, the TSOs and DSOs if that is not done in a succinct way, and the markets can assist in doing that because effectively they can API into the IT systems of the DSOs and TSOs to actually simplify the cost of transactions and um, the data exchange. So lastly, maybe just to mention, we are going from long-term PPAs, hopefully in the next few years, to short-term PPAs. And that effectively means to be able actually, if I may use the word, to chop up generation into smaller chunks that allows actually to use these blocks of generation to allocate and aggregate in a different way. So the topic of short-term trading and allowing actually PPAs to be split into smaller chunks is a huge important element to get actually markets to trade. So this is in a nutshell, um, our view on what marketplaces can assist in, in terms of the deregulation process. And with that, I would like to hand back to Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Holger, also for sticking to the time constraints in a very complex subject. Uh, it's not easy to cover what you've covered in 20 minutes and I really do appreciate uh, that you have kept to the timing so uh, meticulously. <laughs> so uh, thank you Holger. Holger was uh, signing in from Basel in Switzerland.
uh, and uh, you can see that we've got people coming in from all over the world, uh, and people with significant experience in the South African sector, indeed. So um, really an interesting uh, presentation about the, um, uh, the, the pool uh, and the trading platform uh, that you provide, uh, Holger, uh, and uh, your company um, uh, as well, uh, the Independent Energy uh, Pool. Um, so we're now going to move on uh, to our next presentation, uh, which is going to be jointly presented by Johannes Barker and Longo Cella. And I think, and I don't want to uh, speak for them or preempt their presentation, but I think they're going to bring a regional context uh, to this discussion that is going to be really interesting. So Johannes uh, is signed in from Germany. And Longo is signed in from Zambia, and uh, I'm not going to read you through their, um, uh, their their biographies because we have shared that on the uh, uh, on the on on the, on the chat program. Uh, but if I may ask um, you, Johannes or Longo, to share your presentation at this point, um, and I'll just mention that Johannes has experience in emerging markets for many years. Uh, he's worked for KFW, that is the German Development Bank, in various departments, including treasury and portfolio management. Uh, he's founded his own business. Uh, he's spent time uh, with the Climate Change Fund of KFW, and uh, and, and he's been involved in, in, in you know in, in the cash flow model for a clean development mechanism pro for projects of clean development mechanisms. So uh, it's great to have you on board here, Johannes. Um, and also, if I may tell you about Longo quickly, he is an electrical engineer from the University of Zambia, and uh, he worked at the Copper Belt uh, Energy Corporation, uh, as well as Mapani Copper Mines in various roles. And uh, he's also engaged in various multi-sector development initiatives at both local and international level with the African Union and Ethiopia and the Commonwealth in the UK. And uh, really, Longo aims to create and catalyze development inflection points for the continent of Africa. So we're really now talking about the regional context and in the Southern African context. So great to have both Longo and Johannes on board. And I think I'm now handing over to Johannes uh, to present the first part of his presentation, after which uh, Longo will come in. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, also to the previous speakers. Um, yeah, I'm walking you through to um, through our understanding of energy trading, um, but also uh, focusing on the Southern African power pool. Um, so I will introduce uh, Greenco a bit, uh, maybe um, explaining a few terms um, which are quite common on, in the trading desk to avoid uh, confusions going through throughout that presentation or in the following ones. And then I'm um, handing over to Longo, um, who explains a bit uh, what is the Southern African power pool, uh, why it's important, why we have to also um, have a look at the regional lens. And then we focus a bit more on the operational side, um, because we have to ask ourselves, what does a trader need to do and need to be capable of um, if if a trader can provide a value add to to the industry. So this is our presentation. Of course, um, within twenty minutes we have to to see and only can uh, scratch the the surface. But I'm excited to to walk you through. Um, when it comes to Greenco, I think um, and thanks for the introduction of my previous life. I think in the last seven years it, it was dominated together with um, the team to set up Greenco. Um, the need for Creamco um, was arising from the observation that through the lack of bankable PPAs and uh, lack of creditworthy structures is really hindering the investments in renewable energy to date. Um, of course, the regulations are now changing and we're seeing that also the market is opening up. And I think um, that's where we see a huge um, value uh, traders can bring and we as Greenco as a structure because we want to really facilitate more greenfield investments through the, um, a credit worthy off taker being an intermediate credit worthy off taker um, and designing a buy and um, supply and demand uh, portfolio um, and being strongly capitalized allowing us to be that credit worthy off taker and that portfolio approach then allows also to mitigate risk which are in the market and to manage and um, and uh, 
yeah, take also some risk in the market. We, we go a little bit more into the operational levels, what that means. Um, and we are at the moment uh, operationally based in Lusaka. We have um, multiple subsidiaries uh, throughout the region and, and also in, in South Africa, where we are focusing on our project with EMEA Power and Standard Bank as our mandated lender. We have um, a large team um, of um, traders and lawyers to really allow us to set up and uh, provide the solution for the clients throughout the continent. The reason why we want to focus on the regional part is because I think we as a sub-member are best placed to explain a bit how what the sub is doing, the Southern African Powerful and Pool, and what are the, the benefits for, for, for everyone um, to yeah, minimize the cost of electricity through regional integration. I will not uh, go further into any further details and really focus on um, the introduction of a few trading items before we hand over. I have, I'm handing over to Longo. Just one or two things here regarding certain terms. For example, schedules is an important one. You will hear throughout the presentation and um, you have, I guess, heard before. Schedules are basically the timetables, the time series that um, are sent through um, at the moment via Excel and email through the uh, utilities between the generator or then the trader sitting in the middle. These schedules are becoming more and more important um, that these schedules are done um, in day ahead because we're trading energy in the future and then it becomes important that this is synchronized with a balancing framework and balancing requirements many markets have balancing requirements because the tso has to to balance the grid of course on a day-by-day -day basis um the system operation uh, operator and the participants especially the generator also need to be a bit accountable for their injection and what they have predicted to inject into the grid and I believe that South Africa is also um, introducing some of these balancing requirements in the near future the time of use concept of course is very important for a trader I think that's uh, quite a known concept uh, also on the retail um, electricity bill but when you deal with multiple reach markets you have different time of use in different countries um, the power pool has potentially a different time of use than the individual um, local utility so that's an, a very important concept and of course also contractually when it um, when it's about to how to classify power uh, in its value um, other terms are curves uh, and profiles focusing on the actual quantity of electricity but also the forward curves where traders have to have an assumption on how the prices are developing over the next uh, years or up to 25 years if, if they're signed up for long-term PPAs. Um, I will now hand over to Longo Cella, our trading manager in Osaka, to um, walk you through a bit uh, the Southern African power pool. So Longo, over to you. Thanks, Johannes, um, for that introduction. Uh, and thanks, everyone. Great to join you. So I'm going to be speaking to um, uh, how effectively traders can be positioned to be able to uh, unlock this value from an operational and technical perspective. But before I do that, I'll just highlight the context in which um, uh, this sits, which is the South African Purple. So what we know um, is that uh, for the Purple that we are in now, SAP um, was established in 1995, but trading really commenced way before that in the 1950s. Um, since then, SAP has really become uh, the most advanced and mature power pool on the continent, providing a blueprint for other power pools, including um, the East African power pool, uh, comprised of 20 members, uh, of which Greenco is, 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 is uh, one of those members, the 18th member, and first under the new market participant category. Um, SAP has been structured in such a way that it reports ultimately to the SADC Council uh, uh, through the Integrated Council of Ministers, um, and um, in terms of market operation, it's been structured in such a way that um, it's a clearinghouse enabling for um, um, settlement between buyers and sellers. And so we really have that um, um, modern setup with SAP that's, enabled, that's able to um, conclude settlement of trades. When you speak about markets, um, 
uh, we're speaking broadly about these two elements of bilateral and competitive markets. Um, uh, by far, the largest in terms of volume is the bilateral market, um, whereby um, market participants or members of SAP or recognized parties are able to enter into bilateral uh, agreements. Um, say from that, you have the competitive markets, uh, um, which are distinguished based on time of delivery. So you have the forward markets monthly and weekly, um, whereby uh, power is delivered on a, a week ahead, on a monthly and week, week ahead um, perspective, respectively. You have the day ahead market, which is actually the predominant market by way of volume, um, whereby you're able to um, uh, buy and sell, um, able to uh, submit bids for delivery of power on a day ahead basis. It's worth pointing out here that um, one, one key thing that, that comes out, of course, is the a closed and open auction market in which the Ford physical market, the day ahead market are uh, closed auctions in which bidders submit um, uh, their buy or sell bids for uh, a market uh, clearing price, which is the equilibrium of that interaction. The intraday market forms um, a continuous market whereby uh, power is delivered on an hour ahead basis. Uh, it's an open market whereby traders are able to um, offer power, uh, but also hit um, uh, offers that have been made on the market. Then most recently, you have the balancing market that was introduced uh, as part of the competitive markets, um, and we are yet to see uh, any activity that's to take place uh, in the current, uh, in, the, in, in, in the balancing market. It's Help to highlight um, key market trends. Um, so since it's being established, the sub-market has really uh, grown, like I mentioned earlier, to really being um, a mature and the most advanced uh, market in the continent. But there's still more value to be unlocked. When you compare the turnover in, um, in volumes, for instance, on the Southern African Purple, you have just north of seven terad hours being traded in the sub annually. When you compare this to the notebook, for example, um, it's a significant disparity. We have over a thousand terawatt hour of, of power being traded on pool. So this just highlights even more the value of trade as able to unlock uh, some of this opportunity. I spoke earlier about the bilateral market, um, which uh, is uh, accounts for seventy to eighty percent of um, all volume traded in the market. Um, uh, aside from that, when you look at the competitive markets, the dead market dominates. Um, all of their markets, really dwarfing all the markets with about 80% uh, of volumes traded. Uh, when you speak about liquidity, again, uh, it highlights even further the need for, for traders on the market. Um, on, on both supply and demand dynamics, you have a dominance of three to four players that make up uh, easily 90% on, on both the demand and supply side, respectively, those three to four uh, players on, on, on each side. Um, and so one of the things that you see also, which is exemplified by the graph to my top um, left, is um, a strong hydrological influence um, that bolsters this annual trend. So you see that towards the end of the year, um, as hydrology impacts um, volumes, prices do tend to, uh, to increase. Um, it highlights further the, the necessity and the benefit that regional markets can play in bringing uh, together different technologies on board to be able to uh, hedge against some of these uh, movements. Um, which brings me to um, the benefits really of regional energy markets. As you can see there, uh, some of those are highlighted in terms of market efficiency, transparency, but worth highlighting that again, you have um, these uh, various uh, technologies and business models that can be enabled um, through purpose. Um, in fact, there is a study that was conducted that highlighted that one such purpose, one such purpose, say the East African purple, um, uh, was able to unlock an estimated $8.6 billion in value, uh, in addition to 30% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, so just to highlight and underscore some of the benefits that these regional uh, uh, energy markets can can have uh, when harnessed and when traders are able to uh, to unlock these synergies that exist. Now moving on to um, the trading desk. So how can uh, a trader be positioned from an operational and technical perspective to be able to unlock the value in renewable energy markets? 
our understanding from best practice in the region um, and across the world is uh, typically on a high level, you'd um, organize your trading desk in such a fashion that you have your front, middle, and back office functions. Um, whereby front office, you have your trade execution and do capture, um, your scheduling, which uh, Johanna has already alluded to, and your middle office, where you have um, your market analytics, risk management, your position monitoring, among other functions. Your back office would really look at the reconciliation in your settlement and your invoicing and various elements around the settlement of a trade. Our philosophy at Greencoin, in terms of how our um, trading desk is structured, just to give it as a case in point, um, is that with a, a team of highly skilled uh, people that um, across the functions of, uh, of the trading desk um, uh, that ensure that um, yeah, we're able to uh, unlock this value and actually um, trade this power, as well as uh, an element of a trading system, which I shall get into more details. Um, so there's a, a leading uh, ETM system, for instance, in our case, they have developed for end-to-end -end execution of trades. Um, this is underpinned further by risk, uh, prudent risk uh, and workflows that enable operational excellence, uh, as well as uh, ensure data integrity. Having spoken about that, moving on to your, your, your IT infrastructure really forms a critical bedrock of your trading desk. So to put it in perspective, your ETM is really your enterprise uh, software platform um, that enables you to be able to make precision end-to-end -end management of physical and financial positions. Um, as a case in point, you would have executed a trade, for instance, and you, there is need to be able to book this deal that is managed across um, the, the, the value chain of, of your trading desk. You would typically spend an enormous amount of time um, to be able to actually make this work. So to put it in perspective, um, one PPA deal would require multiple cost curves uh, and price curves, each of which could easily be a quarter of a million data points. And so with uh, the need for these different uh, forward curves and, 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 and cost curves, you easily stack up the requirements in terms of your data management in millions of data points for a single PPA. Uh, and so the, uh, your ETM really forms um, a very critical part of your trading desk IT infrastructure, enabling you to be able to um, harness all of this data and store all of this data and manage your trade from end to end, from the moment that the trade is executed, it's booked in the system, to the moment the trade is being uh, settled. Uh, just to underscore here that the ETM system uh, that Green Core utilizes uh, was built by global leading consultants um, and uh, was made to function in the context of the regional energy markets in which operate, that is SAP. In addition to your IT infrastructure that forms the bedrock of your functioning of your trading desk, uh, there's also a need to be able to ensure that they are robust and stringent um, workflows, procedures that guide the interaction between machine and people. Uh, what I mean is being able to have your traders know exactly what they're doing, where each element flows from across your swing lanes. And so from the moment that the deal is, is, is entered to the moment that it's, it's settled, what are the various interactions that are there? And um, what are the, those interactions? So we have developed something based on best practice that ensures that uh, data integrity and operational excellence um, uh, is ensured uh, in this process. Uh, and in, in, in this fashion, as well, we've, we've had a chance to battle test this. Um, and um, it's just to highlight the fact that um, procedures are important uh, and workflows are, 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 are cardinal to ensure that you're able to run your trading desk. I'll hand over now to Johannes to speak to the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Longo. Um, yeah, I'm using the last few minutes to to wrap up and also to, but also give a bit context why why we need all this. Um, it's all great that we're having these systems and these procedures, but why is this required? Why uh, traders should have something like that um, to play an important role? 
And I think the the day to day operational excellence is uh, is quite quite crucial for a trader. So you have to be on top of your data. We have heard about the many many data points or the the lot of information are circulating back and forth between the TSO system operation uh, operator as well as the power pool, the trader, multiple PPAs. Um, with the data management and the accuracy is is crucial. And of course, uh, we need an, an, a robust system that can handle that. That can be also um, be very transparent, um, especially if a trader is, is acting on behalf of a client. And overall, um, errors in, in the trading business are extremely expensive. Uh, one number typed in at the wrong place um, can suddenly lead to huge losses for the trader. So there, therefore, a trader should, for their own interest, um, invest quite heavily on, on trading system and workflows. Another point, of course, what's important to have the operational setup um, of of the trading desk, but also the overall trading uh, the overall team um, with with regulatory and legal function is um, the the question about the the integration on the operational level. Meaning um, on the regulatory side, of course, we we engage quite heavily with regulators, policymakers to really make sure that the new market rules are implementable and and are working on a day by day basis. And and that day by day. Um, communication with with the individual parties of the sector are crucial as well. I think we have touched um, already in the previous uh, presentation and in the introduction on the financial close dilemma, the, the bankability, the mismatch of, of tenors and how to unlock this. So I think traders themselves need to be bankable. I think a trader cannot just be a broker that matches a certain asset to a client and really needs also to be able to, to take um, risk on the balance sheet. We have to move away from these project finance structure and create a, a credit worthy commodity market. And um, we really have therefore the need to, to have a proper trade book, a portfolio approach. We have to decouple the, these assets and allowing therefore clients to offer much more um, service and, and flexibility. And um, for that, the trader has to manage risk. The, the trader has to identify risk has to exactly see what the exposure is and then um, can take and structure this risk where others maybe can't. And this is the value add of a trader because then you can allow clients market access uh, to regional markets, to domestic markets, um, but you also on the other side provide the bankable PPAs. Um, you can provide long-term PPAs um, and, and take that on the book and then um, slicing and dicing that to multiple clients. I think we have to go away to think I'm buying a certain portion of a solar plant. Um, we really have to say, okay, I want power, I want green power, and I want power in that and that profile. Um, and this flexibility, I think traders can then provide um, by yeah, providing different terms, um, differentiating between firm and non-firm as um, power and certificates can be added to that, but should be also decoupled to provide full flexibility. And I think traders should also play a role in providing bespoke service because that's I think at the moment the utilities can, cannot deliver um, with, with all these clients and the traders can therefore take a very service oriented approach. And I think we have trader, traders can then also um, have some benefits on the price certainty and especially also, of course, on the tariff itself. And at some point, we're hopefully moving into a structure where we have also derivatives futures and um, providing more price certainty even over multiple years. Um, we can use use these markets, what we see in other regions. So that's a little bit what we wanted to present um, on the importance of regional power pools, as well as the importance of operational of an operational trading desk. And uh, thanks so much. And I'm handing over back to Chris. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Johannes and Longo, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, you know, including the regional aspects, but also the the value add. Uh, that traders can bring and should bring uh, if they want to have a place in the sun, as it were. Um, a lot of questions coming up on the Q&A, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to try and get to those. I'm sure we're not going to cover them all. Uh, but uh, I mean, the questions that came up during Johannes's talk in my mind was, uh, you know, the, the, the need that, that traders uh, have to be uh, very strongly uh, uh, credit worthy. Uh, they have to be strongly capitalized. They have to have deep pockets uh, because they uh, have significant ex financial exposure on their on their balance sheets. Uh, but I think these are questions that are going to come up for you uh, dur dur during the uh, Q&A. But I want to now introduce you to Kaya Mbata. Uh, Kaya is the operations manager at PowerX. 
And, uh, you know, uh, Kaya has been involved in the design and implementation of the PowerX trading platform and its continuous management and improvement. Uh, uh, you know, PowerX being, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Kaya, I understand that PowerX was the very first licensed trader in South Africa. So there's obviously room for continuous management and improvement. He gets involved with contracting and onboarding of IPPs to the, I, uh, to the PowerX platform and deals with various trader stakeholders, including IPPs, lenders, customers, municipalities, ESCOM, NURSA, of course, and other related associations. So great pleasure to now hand over uh, to Kaya to present his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good, good, good afternoon to the audience. I'm happy, pleased to be sharing the PowerX experience in our market, how we've developed over time since the early days. It wasn't easy, but since the early days to date. And maybe I can sit and just play for As you correctly said, uh, as you correctly said, Chris, we're the first licensed energy trader. We were licensed in 29 at uh, we're using the name the Estual Amatola Green Power, which we which have been rebranded as uh, rebranded to Power X ever since since 2016. We have over a decade uh, decade of experience in trading. Started in 2013 in Nelson Mandela Bay, where we first traded our first kilowatt hour in Nelson Mandela Bay. It was around July 2013, so meaning that today we're just over a decade. Uh, in in our trading experience, as long as it's clean, as long as it's clean and renewable, we are very much technology agnostic. Our our current fleet, the generation fleet that, that we buy from, includes solar PV, wind, hydro, and biomass. So we do have that recognition and that understanding that in the energy mix, all of these technologies, all of the technologies have their role and specific significance. Our key, our key aspects is to use is to use our license and energy trading platform to enable or to further advance the uh, distributed renewable energy generation in South Africa. So when I say key uh, key key assets is our license, which allows us to buy power from multiple generation sources and on sell it to multiple consumption sources, uh, uh, which which are your customers. The second is the uh, second is the is the is the platform is the platform that we've developed in house. It's tried and tested. We've been using it for a number of years now. It seamlessly, it's, uh, the reason we call it dynamic, it seamlessly integrates into any utility setting. So we're currently using it in, in, in our trading models, and this is what we, we this is the platform that we currently use in our endeavors. So colleagues, if I can just take you through a journey, if I can just play a short clip, when then we'll go back to the discussion. I'd just like you to take you through a journey as well of background of PowerX and where we are and where we where we're from, where we currently are and where we're going. And uh, just highlight some of this, the significant milestones that we've encountered over the years since 2009, since 2009. I'll talk, I'll talk you through it. In 2009, we get we get we get awarded our trading license by NERSA. 2013, we, we we commence trading in Nelson Mandela Bay. 2016, we get rebranded fully rebranded to Power X from Mamato Power. 2018, our trade uh, reaches uh, 10 megawatt contracted capacity. We sell we sell our, we we source our first ESCOM to ESCOM generation to consumption. 2022, we reach our 30 megawatt uh, milestone and contracted capacity. This year, we've signed 125 megawatts of, of PPAs, which will come online. In 2024, we will be building the facilities. This is just a, 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 less, a, a less busy snapshot of, of a graphical illustration of where we come from, of just the check, check record of where we are in terms of our check. You can see from early days, from 2013 to 2014, we were trading a very modest amount of about six, six gigawatt hours, six gigawatt hours per annum of trade, renewable energy trade. And it's only in 2016 towards 2017 when certain rate, when we when we signed up more gen when we started signing up middle and um, medium-sized generation facilities and things started opening up in terms of the regulations uh, uh, regulation. Then we then you start seeing that steep 
that steep, uh, we started enjoying that steep uh, trend of growth, growth 224 to, to where we currently are in 2023, 2024, where we're trading over 100 gigawatt hours, 100 gigawatts per annum of, uh, uh, of trade. And in 2025, that online, uh, that plant capacity that we have will see us going to uh, see that sharp growth to uh, over, over 400 gigawatt hours per annum. And that we're quite excited and looking forward to. All of this didn't come, uh, we obviously are not too focused too much on the challenges because they are, they do become uh, they do become opportunities. And that's we that's what we exactly did, made the, turn them into opportunities. But you can imagine at the time, 10 years ago, uh, with the regulatory ticket that uh, PowerX would have had uh, was a trader you'd had to come in. Uh, it was wheeling arrangements, not, not the market not really understanding who the various actors are and what the role uh, so that confusion, so charting a new path at that time, which was 10 years ago, was really, really a, a key, some of our key milestones, things like at some point it was 100 kilowatt, anything, any connection over 100 kilowatt needed some certain exemptions, it was later lifted to, it was later lifted to a megawatt, anything under a megawatt, then you could, you, you didn't need a ministerial uh, mini RP deviation, so I'm happy to say, I'm happy to say that has been lifted now and uh, Hence, hence that growth focus that you see in year 2025, that now we've, we, we're now enjoying a, a lot of bigger projects because of that lifting. At that time as well, prices were prohibitively high. At the, 10 years ago, a couple of years ago, the solar and wind prices were very high, prohibitively high. And unfortunately they would have had to transfer into the PPA. So that was one of the, one of the biggest points that we had to navigate at the time. Developing a trading platform, that, that, that there, were also, there was also no platform. So any trade would have had to take on a very, very rudimentary nature, very mechanical, mechanical type of way. But I'm happy to say that our trading tested uh, trading platform that PowerX has developed, now we seamlessly integrate into any municipal setup or into any utility setup, and it interfaces with, uh, with, with, with any utility supply. And that's what, that's how we've used it. And that's how we've developed the platform. And we've also, uh, lastly, we've had to mitigate the where uh, we, we had to establish or come up with mitigation interventions. This this is, this comes with the misalignment or inherent misalignment between misalignment between your generators would want a, a, a different term to a twenty year term versus your consumption side or your customer side. So it's PowerX that came in with that intervention or that buffer. How do you handle that that misalignment of the gener generator versus consumption? And I think I'll talk more on that on the on the later slides. How it work? How it works? So the trading model. Uh, this is a high level schematic diagram of how it works. Where PowerX lies in the center and facilitates facilitates the chain and the agglomerator facilitates the entire transaction. So PowerX would be at the center would sign a, a generator PPA, generator PPA at the generation side where the generation lies or the point of generation is. So as you see, uh, this is the fleet of generation renewable and, and clean energy that we buy from. These PPAs vary from anything from five to 20 year PPAs on the generation side. And then uh, and once, once they've generated, the power is exported into the grid. This is where PowerX enacts or implements the wheeling agreement, which has been signed between ESCOM and between ESCOM and PowerX and or between a municipality or the distributor and PowerX. So the wheeling fees, the offset is done and the wheeling fees are taken. And then PowerX then supplies the power, supplies the power or, or directs the power to the various, through the platform, directs the power to the various CNI customers through uh, via the customer PPA that has been signed. So, so if I can just if I can just mention again, our customer PPAs vary from on the other side vary from anything from one to twenty years renewable. Most of them are, are renewed, but they vary from anything from a one year to twenty year term. So benefits to the PowerX customers: a uh, number of uh, of things have been eliminated. So currently, there is no interference with any kind uh, infrastructure in, infrastructure. So there is nothing. Where the point of consumption, the customer, you just install, you just install a web-enabled meter that the readings can be taken from from that point of consumption. There is no cop capital or operational outlay from the customer side. 
so the customers can enjoy, can they do enjoy uh, power procurement or alternative power procurement from from re, from a renewable energy source, but without laying any capital, uh, any ups, uh, in upfront capital operation outlay, which 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 is quite enjoyable, which is quite impressive to the customers. Installation, there is no installation of generation equipment, so there is no embedded. So if there is no rooftop, so you still enjoy procurement because this is just a virtual offset offset that is done by PowerX from a renewable energy source or generation source. So you don't need any roof size or any roof space or any land for, for supply. Actually, again, so with the PowerX trading model, what, what we've introduced it to the utilities and to customers and to generators is, is a dynamic, there's a trading model that is dynamic, that has dynamic trading, trading capabilities and seamlessly has the potential with any utility supplier, as as I've mentioned, as I've mentioned, so with the offset, so as the, the distributor with offset and whatever 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 power supplied by Power X would be known as the clean power, the clean element, and that would send a separate invoice for. So the utility, the customer still gets a still gets a, a, an invoice from the utility, but with the offset that Power X has supplied and. And then you get two invoices. The, the second invoice. This is the only effort that's required from the customer is that they get a separate, a separate, a separate invoice from PowerX, which has alternative costing, mainly a discount, a discount from anything and any other savings and all the other savings that come with uh, not buying the power directly from the grid. Six, secondly, that you any all, all the power that's introduced into to the customer point of connection by PowerX. As a renewable, as a company, as a company by a renewable energy certificate, which is a verification instrument, verification of the of the clean nature of the renewable nature of the power. So this is used. This is quite an imperative for customers that want to report on their net zero net zero carbon emission targets and uh, bragging rights as well. Benefits to benefits to existing uh, and prospecting. So when so what we get into distributors or into utilities, they can enjoy a tried and tested, uh, tried and tested platform at no cost to them, but by just uh, allowing third party third party access to the grid, and this allow, this allows exchange of independent power. I think I was at uh, supporting distributor revenues. So obviously, for each kilowatt hour, each commodity, which is a kilowatt hour that is transferred over the, the grid, the municipal gets remunerated for that at the at, at the agreed upon use of systems fee. There are no there are no infrastructure costs associated with the municipality adopting our trading platform, our trading model. There are no infrastructure costs. In fact, if anything, it's a benefit to the municipality uh, to 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 the utilities was. Any of the upgrades that are required for the generators to connect, usually that benefit accrues towards the municipality and the municipal grid. This has seen a lot of this has attracted a lot of investors to uh, investments to the sector to, to the to, to the energy sector, which is positive. And uh, a, a, a happy customer is a happy municipality. And some of these customers, particularly in the Nelson Bay, and some of the customers that we supply to ESCOM. They, it's the imperative for them to go green and to re, for for their reporting and for their quotes, whatever they, they need, their science, science, scientific science based uh, uh, targets. So they've been enjoying this. So these these some of these customers have been able to stay within certain uh, within the distribution network or not leave the municipality because they do get that alternative supply, clean supply, which they require. What are the benefits to the generators? As mentioned before, it's it's avoiding that single point of failure where there is a one-to-one -one bilateral agreement. So God forbid something happens to the to the to the consumption facility, then then the generator, the generation facility or the generator is left with a, a standard asset. Or what happens to the to to the generator if they fall or what happen, what, what whatever can happen or go wrong with this, then the customer is left without without the green power that is required or they reported one or the forecasted on and the savings and the associated savings. So we've mitigated that that in, in, in our agglomeration model because we agglomerate, we buy from multiple and sell to multiple. At every given point that a customer will always have power, green power to buy from from the multiple from the fleet that we source from.
This means that IPPs can focus on their core business without having to manage customer relations and having to manage uh, customer PPEs, which I assume they wouldn't want to. Our dynamic uh, allocation platform ensures that for each and every kilowatt hour that any generation facility or any generator puts into the grid, contracted to PowerX is allocated to a customer point and is remunerated, re remunerated for. PowerX also provides gener generators with PPAs up to 20 years. So the, the, the question, the misalignment in tenure where you, you can't get a 20 year PPA, PowerX provides for that. Provides, we, we got gen we got PPAs up to 20 years of where we're required by the generators, which is most of our generators for their lending so that the lender can still make, recover the money and make a, a margin that's agreed upon. So all of these four all of these four tools have allowed us, have enabled us to, to, to secure funding for a number of our generators. And hence the, hence the development that you see from 2017 and including our check record. This is a uh, this this is just a, this is a snapshot of our customer base. Mainly, some of our uh, these are long long standing uh, PPAs. Uh, this, this some of some of these PPAs we, since we started trading, we've been trading with them, and the number of them has just renewed on a, on 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 whatever basis they need to be renewed. So these are some of the customers that we have. Yeah, but below here are generator customers that we have. We follow the sugar merchants or coal generator. And all of all of these all of these power purchase agreements were able to bank off the of of a power X PPA. So it's um so it's it's very exciting times. I'm not sure if my presentation was short, but it's very exciting times, and I hope I hope everyone's excited as about us. And I just like to share to share where power X is going and what we see in the future and some of our endeavors and what we are participating in and the programs that we are participating in in the in the in the, in the near future. Thank you very much, uh, Kaya. No, your what presentation you was not too short. Uh, the presentation was excellent. We really enjoyed it. And to be honest, I am excited as I think you are about the future of trading. I think it plays a very important uh, role in the future uh, electricity supply industry. So thank you uh, sincerely for that presentation. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now move on to our last presentation uh, before we move to a wrap up and Q and A. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, to you um, Aisha Gear. I hope I've pronounced your surname uh, correctly, Aisha, but I'm sure you will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and if I can ask you to bring up your presentation. Um, uh, Ayesha is the Operations and Finance uh, Director at uh, the Energy Exchange of Southern Africa. Uh, she holds a, a business science degree from the University of Cape Town, uh, specializing in finance and accounting. And you know, when I have listened to these presentations, I kind of realized that this is all about IT and data and accounting and finance. It's not so much about physical uh, generators and machines and pipes and steam and nuclear reactors, etc. But it's really a 
It's really a financial uh, transaction uh, where IT skills and data processing become critical. So a person specializing in financing, accounting, uh, and investment banking and advisory, I think, uh, has got the right kind of skills. The rest of Aisha's um, uh, biography is um, on the, uh, is, uh, you can download it from the chat facility on, on, uh, on Zoom. And uh, it's a great pleasure now to hand over to Aisha to, to give her presentation. Over to you, Aisha. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Um, just a quick check-in. Are you able to see my screen um, shared? Yes, we are, and it's looking good. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So today we will take you through a couple of points. Um, so very quickly, we'll do a quick introduction of our energy exchange business model. Um, and then we'll move into, broadly speaking, about the market. So the first section, we'll delve into the role of a trader, um, broadly speaking. Um, and then we'll also give quite an interesting example on profile engineering, as we see it at Energy Exchange. And then moving into some comments um, and benefits to the electricity supply industry as a whole. So Energy Exchange is a licensed trader. Um, we've been in the market for about seven years now, um, and we have already successfully commenced trading across the national network. We essentially purchase renewable energy um, from a number of independent power producers. We use the network as a toll road and essentially unsell this to private customers. Our private customers currently sit predominantly within the corporate and industrial space. Um, we are an aggregator of electricity, um, and this is done across a technology diverse range of generators. This allows us via profile engineering, which we'll touch on in, in, in a bit, um, to essentially craft a supply profile um, that closely resembles our customers' loads. Um, this essentially creates various cost savings um, and efficiencies for our customers. In terms of our trading platform. Um, we currently operate a technology-enabled trading platform solution, um, which optimizes supply and demand between generators and customers within our trading book. Um, and this, as we mentioned before, creates um, quite a, a large number of efficiencies and cost savings. In terms of our shareholding, um, our current shareholders include Remgro and Rand Merchant Bank. And very quickly touching on our customer offering, um, we currently offer competitive prices with inflation-linked escalations. And what this means for our customers is that they are able to access both price transparency as well as price certainty in the market. We also currently offer shorter-term PPAs. These are on average around the five-year mark. And we also pass on the green benefits to our customers via renewable energy certificates via CEDAREX. And lastly, we also independently verify and validate metering and billing reconciliations for both our customers and generators on our books. So moving forward, um, I'm now going to be chatting through very sort of on a generic basis, the role of a trader in the South African market as we see it today. So you'll note that over time, a trader will essentially evolve into what we deem to be an aggregator or a many-to-many -many model. And what this essentially means is that a trader will essentially purchase from a large number of, of IPPs, which you can see on the diagram on the left-hand side. We as Energy Exchange would sit in the middle, we'll aggregate um, that supply, and we would then craft specific generation profiles that we then unsell to our customers that sit on the right hand side. When you overlay this with smart meters and data analytics, um, a trader sits in a very valuable position where we are able to optimally balance and demand and supply within our portfolio. From a open market and competitive market perspective, this is very beneficial to market operators um, and will play quite a crucial role when the market opens up in, in the future. One last point to make on the slide is that traders are able to enter into longer term generator PPAs on the one side, mm -hmm. and we can then off essentially cut that into blocks and offer shorter term customer PPAs to our customer. So looking at 
the potential benefits um, that trading brings for customers. Um, one clear benefit is the continuity of supply. Um, and this comes in the form of customers being able to access various sources of renewable energy technology. Aggregation, um, an item that we mentioned before, um, this allows, if assuming you were to aggregate your customer portfolio, this would allow a trader to essentially mitigate against the risk of oversupplying or pushing any excess into the grid at any given point in time. Also noted before, long-term price entity and as well as the green benefits. Um, on the green benefits side, we note that the market currently offers either renewable energy certificates via ZRX or in the form of international RECs. And lastly, or not lastly, my bad, um, no upfront or ongoing capital expenditure is, in, is required from our customers. And lastly, the shorter tenor CPPAs that we have on offer is also broadly offered by the market as a whole at this point in time. Um, and you should see this in contrast to what has happened under the REAP space, where you sort of see the longer 20 to 25 year term PPAs for customers. In terms of hurdles faced by traders in the market at the moment, um, there are two that we would like to bring um, to the attention of everyone. The first being grid, co grid capacity constraints. Um, this is quite mm -hmm. a big hurdle for traders at the moment in the market. Um, we note that the lack of grid capacity limits IPP's abilities to evacuate supply into the grid. Um, these delays um, essentially create or essentially prevent traders from accessing sufficient generation capacity in order to supply our customers. The second point um, worth noting is wheeling within municipalities. And I know this has already been touched on by a number of speakers today, um, but we'd like to mention that as it stands today, NERSA currently regulates both ESCOM and municipal tariffs. Um, and this happens essentially on one April and one July annually. We note that municipal wheeling fees are currently not regulated by NERSA. Um, and in terms of not being regulated, um, we note that this is potentially what's causing quite a vast difference in um, wheeling fees across the country from a municipal perspective. We see quite distorted ranges. Um, these range all the way from 28 cents all the way to 97 cents in the market as it stands today. Um, and I guess one of the key reasons or, or behind this um, is essentially linked to the methodologies used in order to determine these wheeling tariffs. So you have either two options. You can either look at a bottom-up approach um, using a cost of supply study. Um, in terms of energy exchanges house view, this is the best approach in determining a fair wheeling fee. What we're finding at the moment in the market is that industry is currently making use of what is called a WEPS credit methodology. In essence, there isn't, it, or rather in principle, this is fine. Um, but what we find is that each municipality has a very different tariff structure. And when you have very different tariff structures, using a WEPS credit methodology leads to very different or very varying um, ranges of wheeling tariffs. Um, we also find that from a WEPS credit methodology point of view, that non-electricity related cost items are also included um, in wheeling tariffs for various municipalities around the country. And, and ultimately, this essentially leads to revenue neutrality for customers. I'm sorry, for, for municipalities. So moving forward, um, I'm now going to jump into a very practical example um, that discusses profile engineering. And in this section, we essentially explore some tools and methodologies that traders can use to optimally match and uh, demand and supply in their portfolios. So as you know, traders focus on quite a, a large or vast range of renewable energy sources. And these can range anywhere from your solar and wind generation supplies, as well as hydro um, and biomass. We note that each of these technologies have very distinct generation profiles. Um, and in this particular example, um, you'll note that we consider essentially a blend of technologies. Um, we look at a hydro, solar, and wind blend. And we then 
in terms of our objective in this example is that we are able to maximize the amount of kilowatt hours that our, our customer can consume um, within an annual period. So what you're seeing on your screen at the moment um, in the gray shaded area is essentially quite a unique agri customer profile. Um, you'll note that there is a seasonal six month demand profile, which peaks um, roughly in July. And with the remaining six months of downtime between the months of November, sorry, between the months of November to April. Assuming we were to supply a combination of solar wind and hydro, this would essentially approximate the red line on your screen. And what's worth noting is that there would be a significant amount of oversupply towards the right hand side of the graph between the months of October to April. So for this particular customer, when looking at a blend of various sources of, of supply, we could potentially provide a combination of solar, wind and hydro. And the cumulative supply curve to the customer would now essentially be below the blue shaded line. A trader would then essentially sell the oversupply to a counter-cyclical customer. And, and just to draw your attention to the right-hand side of the graph, um, the oversupply in this particular graph is essentially below the red dotted line and above the blue line. A trader has two options. You're either able to sell that to a counter-cyclical customer, or alternatively, you can absorb that into your trading portfolio and, and unsell that to a third-party customer. So conceptually, um, this is quite a good example, and it essentially captures the principles of optimization technology that can be followed by traders in order to optimally match demand and supply within their portfolios. Moving on to sort of trading within the electricity supply industry, um, we'll touch quickly on some of the benefits. Um, we'll note that Internationally, um, electricity trading has resulted in numerous benefits for electricity markets across the world. Electricity, electricity trading improves both competition in and the efficiency of the electricity supply industry. We note that traders will play quite an important role in matching customers and generators. And this is done by essentially customizing the amount of kilowatt hours supplied to a customer for their daily operations. Traders will also allow for a greater number of IPPs to connect to the grid um, by purchasing their surplus capacity. And lastly, and probably most importantly, traders will fulfill a balancing role in a liberalized electricity market. So we note that traders will play quite a critical role in the newly reformed South African electricity supply industry, as envisaged by the ERA amendment bill, um, which we're expecting to be um, put in place quite soon. Which And, and just quickly to touch on that, um, we note that the ERA amendment bill, which will broadly allow for trading in the day ahead market, the bilateral market and the reserve market, is where traders are well placed to assist the market um, in in all um, forms. As noted above, um, traders will, will fulfill a balancing role between generators and customers and will potentially also provide auxiliary services to the market operator. Traders also have industry-wide involvement um, amongst other traders in the market, and this cuts across various key stakeholders and industry bodies. We note that by aggregating across various customers, traders are able to provide greater access to renewable energy for all customers. And lastly, traders are well-placed to contract directly with IPPs, um, essentially alleviating the burden on ESCOM. So moving forward to the impact on the industry as a whole, um, we note that traders bring a plethora of benefits for both market participants and the industry. From a market participant perspective, um, as more IPPs become bankable, more customers are able to access and diversify their supply sources. And then with a greater amount of IPPs connecting to the grid, ESCOM can essentially increase their reserve margin and perform much needed maintenance on their fleet. From an industry perspective, um, additional installed megawatts ultimately reduces load shedding for the country um, and this allows the South African economy essentially to recover. 
From a customer perspective, we note that customers will save on electricity costs and they'll also be able to meet their carbon neutrality goals. And from a municipal perspective, we note that any generation built inside of municipal boundaries are able to provide much needed investment into municipalities. And then revenue, any revenue generated from wheeling charges, um, we note that this could potentially be reinvested in transmission and distribution grids um, around the country. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to leave so the audience with a couple of thoughts today. Um, and one being that there is room for more than one trader in the market. Um, and what we need to look towards is fostering healthy competition within the market. And this would essentially allow the electricity supply industry to strengthen and attract investment going forward. And lastly, we'd like to thank the EE Business Intelligence um, for this opportunity to provide a presentation today. Um, thank you, Chris. I'll hand back to you. Well, thank you uh, for those words, uh, Aisha. It's really uh, a great presentation. Thank you for sticking to the time so uh, perfectly. And um, I think you've given us a lot to think about, um, about the value-adding role that traders play. And not only you, uh, but all the other presenters have listed uh, the kind of benefits uh, that uh, traders bring, not only to generators, not only to off-takers, but also to municipalities and ESKIM itself. Uh, I mean, that is why ESKIM is, uh, is encouraging and facilitating uh, traders, because there is benefit to ESKIM for this. And certainly there is benefit uh, to municipalities, generators, and off-takers. So uh, I, I think that really covers the subject well. And it's now really my pleasure to uh, ask uh, my colleague, uh, Lindsay Dyer, uh, who is the Managing Director of the Sixth Wave Africa. Uh, we've worked together on a couple of projects, and it's been a pleasure to work together with Lindsay on this particular project. Uh, so Lindsay's uh, task now is to uh, kind of uh, give us some independent takeaways. She's been watching this webinar with interest, as I have, I must say, uh, and, and I'm sure she has got some thoughts and takeaways on what she's heard, what she's learned. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'd like to welcome Lindsay uh, here today. She is a consultant in her own right. Uh, she is a, a entrepreneur, a community leader, and has served and chaired boards of business chambers and significant nonprofit uh, organizations, as well as her own companies. And she's called South Africa her home uh, for the last 26 years. So it's fantastic to see a Canadian finding their home in South Africa for 26 years. And we hope you're going to be with us for a lot longer than 26 years to come. So over to you, Lindsay, to give us your final uh, thoughts uh, and wrap up before we move on to the Q&A. Thanks so much, much, Chris. Uh, and yes, I hope I, I continue to call not just South Africa, but Southern Africa my home for at least another 26 years. I, I have to say, this has been a really exciting webinar. I, I knew it would be exciting, but it's uh, it's more than lived up to my expectations. And I've been furiously scribbling notes while the presenters were presenting in, in the hopes of actually capturing some of the, the gold nuggets that were dropped in addition to the, uh, the, the kind of general threads that were, were um, present throughout all of the presentations. So uh, I think you've, you've actually summarized it quite well, Chris, for the uninitiated, um, this whole question of electricity trading isn't technical. It's about IT. Well, if you consider that IT and data are not technical, it's not about electrical engineering. It's not about wires. It's about IT, data, accounting, and finance. And um, and all of the presenters really highlighted a similar collection of benefits that um, that would have a game changing impact across the industry. Uh, the electricity supply industry in terms of the providers of electricity, but also consumers of electricity. And the kinds of game changing, I think we, we only really got a glimpse into because we only gave each presenter a little bit under 20 minutes. But um, at a very high level, they all touched on improvements in competition and efficiency. What does improved competition mean? Lower prices. Um, the ability to match customers and suppliers. And uh, when, when 
when I get to a little summary of what Aisha presented, I really appreciated that uh, that graph that she showed uh, that um, indicated how we can actually use excess generation properly and wisely. Um, the, the fact that the trading allows us all mechanisms to easier access renewable energy and in many cases for corporates, renewable energy certificates and, um, and allows IPPs to play a, a more significant role in the Southern African market and that traders themselves will be playing a balancing role in the market. And um, now, now to move into the presentations, the keynote from Anaka Rantwani was really, really exciting. Um, it's it's uh, truly a game-changing proposition as, uh, as Anika very uh, lightly said she was so she was so um uh metered in her presentation of what is is truly going to change the south african and eventually southern african uh, electricity trading landscape and electricity landscape with this concept of virtual wheeling not real wheeling as uh, as we've been living with to date but virtual wheeling so she explained the mechanism and the benefits that uh, that will accrue in south africa but one of the key takeaways there is that the municipalities aren't going to have to change what they do at all billing um, for customers will look the same Customers will get bills the way they always got bills from their electricity service provider. At the same time, if they are signed up to a trader, they will ultimately get credits from their, their traders. So they'll, they'll have two, two sets of, uh, of financial um, documentation coming in from two different sources. But what's exciting is that uh, it's not a threat to the municipalities. I saw in the Q&A that there was a question about the, the potential impact on municipal revenues. I think it'll be very interesting to hear uh, from the, the traders in the Q&A when we, we get to that. Um, more than that, I think she, um, she also confirmed that uh, that well, not only uh, are we uh, ready to now start rolling out the virtual wheeling approach, but she highlighted a couple of future um, really necessary developments. One of the key will be, uh, keys, uh, key developments that we're going to be needing is a national wheeling framework. And I think Aisha's presentation went some way towards indicating not so much that it's a wild west out there in the municipalities, but there's no regulation on municipal tariffs at the moment. Uh, let me rephrase that. No uh, regulation on municipal wheeling tariffs. And, uh, and that creates some, uh, some uncertainties in the market. So not only did, uh, did she highlight that we're going to need a national uh, wheeling framework, she also highlighted that with that there'll be a need for cost of supply studies. Right then, um, moving into the presentations themselves, we had some fantastic presentations, a real scene setter from Holger Janke from Integrated Energy Pool. Uh, that gave us um, uh, an overview of global trends in deregulating electricity markets, which I think was uh, important from a contextual perspective. Um, one of my key bugbears, he highlighted that the uh, two of the key constraints to, um, to, shall we say, fair, equitable, and uh, reasonably priced access to renewable energy are um, project the project finance model and in South Africa, uh, transmission grid access. So those are key constraints. Um, he then started to look at challenges in emerging markets and the, the relevance of wholesale markets and uh, described for us the reallocation function that, uh, that traders can play in the, the market, which set the scene for the, the other traders coming in. Uh, one of the key takeaways for me from Holger's presentation was that he made a strong case for PPAs to be standardized. And uh, it would be interesting to see if, uh, if we can get some action out of that recommendation. We then moved into a really exciting presentation from Africa Green Co. by uh, both uh, Johannes Barker and Longo Cella, who handled the dual responsibilities of presenting really well. Um, 
they gave us um, an intro to trading, which uh, backed up and uh, and in many respects complemented what Holger had uh, had described about the role of traders. Uh, a very interesting overview of the Southern African power pool and where he sits now. And fun fact, uh, I was at the the Pomodzi Hotel in 1995 when the uh, the power pool was launched, and it's come a long way, baby. You know, we we tend to think of the power pool as uh, uh, as still dealing in bilateral trading and not being as sophisticated as uh, as traders in other markets or pools in other markets. But my goodness, it has really come a long way. Um, he, they also gave us some insights into how a tri trading desk is structured in that that three part approach, the client facing, the middle middle desk and the, the back office, uh, which was quite interesting. And uh, and then they, they delved into, again, as each of the presenters has done, the value of traders in, uh, in terms of both solutions and services. Again, a key takeaway from their presentation was that it's time for us to move away from the project finance model, because rather than unlocking investment, it's actually constraining investment and it's constraining access to, um, to renewable energy in particular. Then um, after, uh, I believe that was after our very brief break, we moved into Kaya Mbata's presentation from PowerX. It's, uh, I understand, the longest, um, longest living trader in South Africa and well done to PowerX for grow and, growing and thriving. Uh, Kaya, if uh, I caught you correctly, you're now uh, trading over 400 gigawatt hours per annum, which is really impressive to quite a variety of, uh, of clients and from quite a uh, aggregating supply from quite a variety of off takers. Uh, again, you touched on the benefits to generators and, uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of a repeat of what you said, um, because sometimes we focus on the computer consumer side. Uh, it's important to, to be clear that uh, electricity supply has to be affordable for the supplier as well as the, uh, as the consumer. And so what do you um, what do the traders do? They mitigate risk for IPPs. They allow the IPPs to focus on their core business. They provide a dynamic allocation platform and they give generators um, a PPA for a project lifespan and they can facilitate access to funding. Um, you, you had a lot of other good stuff in there, but uh, but I think people will be able to uh, to draw it out of your presentation when they receive it. Then um, excellent presentation from Aisha Gire from Energy Exchange of Southern Africa. Uh, Aisha, one of the terms you used that I really liked was that um, that traders buy renewable energy from IPPs and then use the uh, the network as a toll road. That's a really good mental image for people who are struggling to, to understand how electrons think. Um, uh, and then using that uh, that toll road concept, uh, the the traders then on sell the power to private customers. Um, one of the the aspects of your presentation that really highlighted the benefits um, of moving away from the project finance model is that traders can uh, buy long on long-term arrangements and then cut those, uh, those arrangements using the platform into shorter blocks to offer shorter tenors to customers who simply cannot be locked into long-term power purchase agreements. Um, at, uh, you, you touched on uh, distortions in wheeling prices, particularly at the municipal level, if I got that right. And, uh, and you also highlighted the, the need for cost of service studies as a basis for tariffing. Um, uh, I mentioned that, uh, that I got a little too excited looking at that graph of, uh, of profile engineering, where you compared a particular agri customer's um, load versus hydro, solar, and wind supply. It was a really interesting example, practical example of how traders can play an optimizing role. And, um, and then you, you close by looking at the potential impact on the electricity supply industry. And I'd like to, to extend that, not just from South Africa, but into Southern Africa. And eventually, um, perhaps our regional power pools will start talking to each other in a meaningful way. So Chris, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and hand over to you to start the Q&A. 
Yeah, well, thanks so much, Lindsay, for a very comprehensive um, overview with your own insights uh, added as well. Um, and I think uh, it really summarized things perfectly. So I would like to now ask uh, any uh, people that want to ask a question verbally, uh, you are welcome to put up your hand uh, and we will certainly come to you. And um, so please feel free to put up your hands. I see some hands going up already. But uh, while they're going up, while these hands are going up, <laughs> I, I would like to ask Annika a question uh, that is on my mind. Uh, and if uh, you can answer this, I'll be grateful. Uh, we get very excited about this virtual wheeling that you've presented. But can you give us uh, some indication of the timelines uh, is this operational? When is it likely to become operational? Are we talking about uh, you know next week, uh, yeah, next month, next year? Or, but just an idea of, of, of the timing. Uh, Anika, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chris. And I, I wish we could say we are. Anika, I'm going to ask you to switch off your camera. Anika, can you switch off your camera? Anika, can you switch your camera off just I to give more bandwidth? Thank off. you. Off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Am I audible mm. now, Chris? Thank Good you. Good to go. Carry on. Yes. Um, I was saying that I wish, you know, um, looking at how critical this product is, I wish we could say we are ready to roll it out tomorrow. But as I said. Uh, the, the policy has been approved as just a proof of concept at the moment, and we are in further developments of, of the product. And just to mention that the critical aspect, and this is what the other speakers have already indicated, is that at the, at the core of this is the IT infrastructure development, which is the virtual wheeling platform that will interface with the, 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 the buyers or the energy traders platforms. So we are still at that stage, Chris, where we are still pegging down the timelines for final rollout and that will be communicated to the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anika. We also look forward to a speedy rollout and I'm sure the industry uh, will do everything it can uh, to help, not just the trader industry, but also the off-takers -taker, off and the business sector. Uh, there's a very high level of or a sense of urgency in this matter and I'm sure they would be uh, delighted to help. I'm going to now take a hands up question um, fr from Kurbis uh, van Tonder. Kurbis, I've uh, allowed you to speak. So if you could switch on your microphone, uh, please keep your camera off just to save bandwidth uh, because there are problems with bandwidth in South Africa at the moment. Uh, and over to you, uh, Kubis. Please indicate where you're from as well. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Kubis van Tonder and I'm from Innerweb. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question. I've also put it on the chat, just on the predicament of the municipalities that are not in good standing with ESCOMAL that will potentially impact the implementation of, of the virtual wheeling. And then also quite interested to know, I mean, currently the balancing sort of in terms of peak standard off peak when, when wheeling um, takes place is balanced on a monthly time of use basis. I was wondering if there's intention from ESCOM to shorten that sort of balancing period. Um, I mean, I think the city of Cape Town is aiming even for half hourly sort of balancing of, of that, just indication of what the thinking is as far as that is concerned. Thank you, Kubis. And uh, Kubis from Enerweb uh, is, is involved also in uh, uh, trading platforms. And uh, I believe, or I'm led to understand that uh, the South African Power Pool make use of Enerweb's uh, services as well as other countries like Namibia, Botswana, and, um, and of course, Eskom itself. Uh, so thank you very much for that, uh, Kubis. Is there anybody uh, of our presenters that would like to tackle uh, the answer uh, to uh, you know, to to those uh, questions uh, that had been posed by Kubis. If you want to just switch on your mic and just uh, talk away, uh, presenters, you are encouraged to step in here. 
Now answers from our presenters. This is not good. <laughs> um, um, yeah, Chris, let, let me give that um, a try. Thank you. So um, on the very first question around the, the, the Munich's not in good standing, and I assume this is related to virtual relief. So remember that we explained that the refunds will be provided on the basis that we have overcharged the individual accounts of customers. Therefore, um, if uh, there is obviously ESCOM needs to, re to first receive the payment through the, the, you know, the, the customer's electricity account for us to effect the, 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 re the refund to, to, the, to, to the buyer or the trader. So um, how it will work is that the, the municipalities that are not in good standing and we haven't received the payment from municipalities for that month, we will not affect the, the willing credits or the willing refund. Yeah, that's really interesting uh, that, you know, the credit worthiness of the municipality is critical uh, to this. So it doesn't impact uh, their billing system, doesn't impact their metering. But the credit worthiness and the ability of that municipality to pay ESCO uh, is critical to, to this. So I'm yeah. sure there will be uh, critical credit control measures with municipalities to, you know, uh, to, you know for qualifying uh, customers uh, to qualify. In other words, uh, I, I guess a, an off taker embedded in a, a non credit worthy. Uh, municipality might have a hard time in, uh, you know, using this trading uh, arrangement, the virtual trading arrangement. Thank you for that. Um, uh, look, I, I, I don't think the question of the time of use, or shall we say, the, uh, you know, the, 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 what is it, the granularity of, of the of the billing period, one hour, half an hour, etc., was touched on. Uh, is there anybody who would like to touch on the on this? Johannes, would you like to come in here? Um, yeah, very happy to to give a guess because, of course, it's uh, subject to to ESCOM and, and NERSA. But I, I would assume we're moving um, towards an hourly balancing um, and, and and scheduling framework, um, at least uh, from from the sub perspective from the Southern African Power Pool that uh, that market operates on an hourly basis. So therefore, this would be my my best guess. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, that's what what is our assumption at the moment. Great. I'd like to now move on uh, to Francis uh, Jackson. Uh, Francis, I'm allowing you to talk, uh, so please do uh, switch on your microphone. Francis is from the Energy Council of South Africa. He's also been previously involved with uh, Green Cape. Uh, so I'm very keen to hear what uh, Francis uh, asks, and perhaps you could uh, address your question through Lindsay, uh, and Lindsay can then put it through to one of the presenters. Hi, thank you, Chris, and thanks to all the presenters. It's quite exciting to see the rapid innovation and introduction of fresh tech and knowledge into the sector. Uh, yeah, I'm supporting the Energy Council in particular on the interface with NECOM and the work streams 9 and 10, which focus on, um, in, in the case of Workstream 9, uh, markets, distribution, and wheeling in municipalities. And they're uh, addressing their financial issues, you know, to do with municipal debt and security deposits as they affect wheeling and the, the drafting of the national wheeling framework and other issues. Um, so it seems you know things are moving rapidly and quite effectively towards being workable in the ESCOM to ESCOM wheeling domain and the virtual wheeling uh, pilots should um, deal with uh, you know automation and such there. I'd like to focus on this suppressed demand and opportunity in municipalities. And there's been some talk about it, some talk about how potentially the virtual wheeling platform would would enable um, or take away some of the challenges in, in wheeling into municipalities from ESCOM. But uh, what is the, the potential in you know, intra-municipal wheeling, so if, um, generated offtaker in one municipality or even from one municipality to another? Uh, so mm -hmm. I think um, the challenges there right now mean that many traders aren't even considering it. They're, they're not the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we don't really understand the potential demand because it's, it's not understood. It's kind of suppressed demand. Um, and although, Lindsay, you said it's not really the Wild West of wheeling out there, I think the evidence based on the unsolicited proposals that people are receiving in municipalities are that, that there is kind of that going on. And, and many municipalities are, start, you know, they're at various different phases of walking that process to, to readiness for wheeling and uh, not always um, prepared to, to field such proposals, not knowing the difference, you know, between what is procurement, what is trading. 
um, and where they fit in. So there's, um, I think, a, an opportunity, firstly, to make sure municipalities are aware of what's happening and how to capture the opportunities for energy resilience and local economic development that come from enabling wheeling and how to make a you know, revenue neutral model and so on but also to be uh, aware of the distinctions between what is trading and what is procurement, um, where, you know, uh, aside from that slightly gray area of what you do with surplus energy, trading shouldn't involve the procurement process for a municipality. So if someone's coming to you and, as a municipality and, and offering some kind of vendor service that actually triggers a procurement, just be aware that it's probably not uh, necessary according to the framework and look into the support you can get from the likes of Sustainable Energy Africa or Green Cape or Ernst & Young who are working with GIZ support. Um, Thank you for yeah, so on the, point, Thank you. Uh, the question I want to ask, sorry, long preamble, uh, to the traders, what is your sense of the suppressed demand? And if you were to escalate some of the maybe three most pressing things that should be resolved to enable intramunicipal wheeling, could you suggest those? Thanks. Is there anybody who would like to take up that? Uh, Lindsay, would you just uh, stir our panelists up and uh, direct the question? <laughs> yeah, I'm tempted to ask Kaya first. Kaya, are you ready to hit this one? Yes, I, th yes, I, th I think the biggest thing is, is, is the security deposits. That's been really a block, a, 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 a huge hurdle. I know that some of the cities like City of Okurulene have kind of looked at uh, putting a waiver or ESCOM has looked at uh, good pay, better paying municipalities putting a waiver, but that's been a big hindrance in the development of the trading and uh, suppressing that, that market there. So that, that one is a big one. Obviously the municipalities also have to get their houses in order with, uh, with payment and how they look or in terms of being backlisted and being good payers. And I also think with the legislation, the conversation should also extend towards the municipalities, not at a national level, how that legislation changes in terms of the MFMA not allowing them to get into any financial obligation over three years, because that obviously just makes it not bankable at all. And all the all the exemptions that are required for that for for to get into that uh, to get into that PPA over for 20 years with that IPP, that needs to be clarified for all of the municipalities. Because it seems like other municipalities that are capacitated kind of have an understanding and they've they've done these treasury exemption applications, but it seems to have not been disseminated. That information or that knowledge seems to have not been disseminated to all their distributors. Lindsay, will you pick up one of your questions uh, from the Q&A, from the text Q&A, and perhaps uh, pose it uh, to one of the panelists? Yeah, uh, in fact, I was intrigued by Frank Spencer's question, which was picked up uh, by a couple of other questioners about ancillary services and uh, and what needs to happen to to this market in order for traders to be able to provide ancillary services as well. Um, Aisha, is that something that you would like to tackle? Yeah, so I could probably touch on it quite briefly. So um, there was some indication from the market this week that there would be potential delays in getting the ERA amendment bill um, in place. Um, so there's some administration related delays that's currently impacting it sitting in front of parliament. So in order to start moving to an open market or competitive market, um, there's a number of steps that essentially have to be put in place. So the first one is essentially isolating ESCOM transmission um, getting significant investment into the the the, trans, the TSO um, as we call it, and then mm -hmm. obviously expanding that transmission grid such that we can then have more IPPs join the grid. So in order to get to that step, um, we do need the ERA amendment bill to be put in place. Um, it seems as if the hopes of having it um, completed this year is probably not um, potentially going to happen. Um, but assuming that's in place and we have a independent TSO, we then move into this world of bilateral trading not being sort of the main focus um, of what traders are currently doing in the market. So you'll have your day ahead markets, you'll have your reserve markets um, and auxiliary services as well. Um, from a South Africa perspective, we're obviously not there yet. Um, so that market still needs to be developed. Um, I think in terms of practical answers around this, um, maybe Holger could potentially assist because he's potentially seen that in the South African 
power pool um, sort of space. Um, but from a trader perspective, we, we're unfortunately just not there yet. Okay, thanks, Aisha. Holger, would you like to catch that pass? I don't have any further comments on that topic um, uh, for the time being, let's say. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, there was another question that came up that I thought would be uh, would be interesting to hear from uh, from our colleagues at Africa Green Co. and uh, and it's a, a Southern African power pool a question. I'm sure it's a, it's a straightforward one for you. What what would be an installed capacity requirement for um, for the Southern African power pool to actually establish a balancing market? Is that an easy one, Longo? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, first of all, just uh, just to point out earlier, I think uh, one of the comments uh, spoke to the ETRM system and how it's built. Just to reiterate that that's something that we've uh, we've built internally. Um, yeah, um, but there are similar off the shelf uh, systems that and 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 and, and uh, uh, you have similar IT infrastructures created for that. Um, On to the balancing market, what we've seen um, uh, is that overall, when you talk about volumes on the sub competitive markets. Uh, per hour, you're talking about anywhere from 150 megawatts to 200 megawatts. Um, but there could be some rethinking, I think, that can be done in terms of how the balancing market actually works in terms of structures that um, that underpin it. Um, yeah, there could be some rethinking that could be done uh, to ensure that it's it's actually uh, utilized. For instance, um, from the IDM, there's an auto transfer system where you can place your bids in the IDM and then um, if there is no match, it can be auto-transferred to the balancing market. So I think those are some things that we could potentially begin to rethink in terms of um, how that uh, how that can be can be utilized. Um, I'm not sure that Johannes would like to speak a bit more to um, what else you can do in the balancing market. Thanks. Thanks. If I can come in here, uh, Lindsay, um, I'd like to address a question to both Kaya uh, as well as to to Holga. Um, and I've seen this question has come up a few times in, in, in the text uh, Q&A. Um, it seems like uh, uh, traders, especially the ones that were in this game early, uh, have gone to significant effort in developing IT uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, and developed kind of, it seems like their own trader platforms, um, proprietary platforms at a, you know, of significant complexity and great cost. Is this the case uh, uh, with the PowerX uh, platform, Kaya? Or do you um, piggyback on um, existing uh, trader platforms? And this brings me to Holger. Uh, it seems like, and, and please correct me if I'm misunderstanding uh, your platform, but I understand that your platform is a platform for traders. In other words, you're not a trader yourself at, in the, at Independent Energy Pool, but you provide a pre-developed platform for other traders to, uh, to, to use, uh, almost like software as a service, uh, and that uh, this can reduce the barriers to entry, the technical and the IT barriers to entry for a trader uh, quite significantly. Am I right in understanding this uh, and, and that your system is, is, is like a platform for traders? And Kaya, is your system a, 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 a kind of a customized solution or, or a proprietary solution uh, that is not available to others? Yes, it is. That's, we've spent a significant amount or small fortune on developing the platform, uh, so specifically for and specifically for trading, so it's in-house developed. I think it took us about two years to to com to complete and finalize, and we're constantly modifying it and working on it. So it is a trading model. So the former the former is is correct. Olga, do you want to take over here and speak? Yeah, sure. So um, I mean, we when we started the business, we looked actually at the relevance of uh, the of a platform as an IT solution. And it became evident very quickly that if you want to be able to adopt to the requirements and the constant changes in the electricity markets, you cannot use standard products that actually are purchased as a package off the shelf. You need to have the ability actually to move with the market. And as a 
as a result of that, we uh, developed a um, uh, an own platform that specifically talks to the requirements of being able to um, match generators and off takers, and it is actually a very integrated topic because. Um, look, you can obviously have a PPA um, and then basically um, a, a record a, a requirement for electricity and, 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 and record a supply of electricity, but effectively it is a direct link between an IT platform and a contractual structure. And both need to talk very closely to each other, because if you go ahead and say, okay, I'm trading X electricity, uh, at that price it has underlying requirements in terms of, well, what are the default mechanisms that stand behind it? So it's a link between a um, legal framework that, has re that is representative, represented in a, in a software. And that's the first complexity around marrying contract and IT. The second complexity is obviously when you trade PPAs, and we all know the story of time of use, quantities that recorded over time, and, um, and um, um, uh, Greenco, um, Africa Greenco alluded to it, the complexity of data and data capture is extremely high. So if you don't have a system there in the background that actually manages the date traded on the, 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 the actual traded electricity, things get out of bound. And lastly, um, you are actually providing an environment that needs to be uh, absolutely sound, and that is sound in terms of protection of data and privacy on this uh, on this platform on the one hand side, and on the other, it's financial transactions that need to be auditable. And most of the, uh, the 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 market participants are actually listed corporates. So you can only provide an environment that actually meets the financial expectations and the soundness of uh, of listed companies. And that's why we went through a huge amount of effort to actually put a platform in place that talks to those elements. Chris, Thank if you. I may ask a follow-on to, to that question. Yeah, um, given, given the significant data requirements uh, to operate these trading platforms and to grow them uh, effectively, to, uh, and I, I'd like to start with Holger because you were talking about specific compliance requirements, but uh, any of the other traders, please chime in after he's responded. To what extent do you see AI and blockchain actually providing a facilitating role in managing these masses of, of data and, uh, and ensuring compliance and through um, provision of immutable records? Holger? Can yeah, you start so, with that, and then whoever else wants to to chime in from the traders. Thanks, Holger. Yeah, no, no problem. So effectively, if I just may just um, complete actually um, my argument on the first on the prior question, it's important to note that uh, that our marketplace is not only for traders. It actually allows off takers and generators to transact, and it is a business to business environment that actually allows everybody to buy and sell electricity. Okay, uh, thanks. Now, uh, the question of blockchain, uh, blockchain effectively is uh, an, an instrument that allows to make sure that agreements that are entered into are recorded and, uh, um, and unchangeable over time so that there's always a, a track record relative to uh, what transactions have been entered into and when. Um, uh, we from uh, IEP don't believe that blockchain is necessary and required. Why is that? It's we, we provide an environment where you record these agreements and these transactions. Uh, as I said, they are auditable, and there are certain uh, I, um, certain IT standards that are relevant that actually provide the security relative to the um, the, the accuracy of the data and also the history of that. That's the one element. And the second element is each transaction is recorded in a document that is being made available between the two parties. So if a party or two parties sign an agreement and they have a document, there is no relevance relative to actually blockchain. Blockchain is a totally um, um, you know, virtual concept that in this instance is not really uh, necessary. Um, the topic of AI, a very, very interesting one, because AI is the question around, well, how do I optimize, right? How do I optimize transactions? And um, 
Um, you obviously need algorithms that allow actually to optimize these transactions. Um, personally, I don't believe that um, that that AI and it's a very wide um, concept that that would fulfill these type of optimizations. It is still something very industry specific. Thanks very much, Holger. Um, Chris, do, do we uh, ask any of the other traders to respond to that, or is Holger? I think let's move on. Uh, we've got so much to get through, uh, Lindsay. So yeah. if I may uh, pose a question, and it was actually posed by Raba Malesi, uh, and I'd like to put this um, uh, to uh, Onika, I think, best, uh, and that is, will virtual wheeling enable the uh, you know trading to extend down to low voltage customers uh, and then of course uh, you know to what extent is this in future going to reach um, you know the residential uh, customers retail electricity trading um, or is this only aimed at big business and big industry and uh, if you can perhaps give us some idea of, of where this is heading in the future thanks Thanks, Chris. Yes, and um, I think this is exactly why I said the, the virtual wheeling is meant to address the limitations that we have with the traditional wheeling approach. So it will be applicable to customers connected at LV. The requirement is that um, they must be on a time of use meter. As you know, that ESCOM just recently got approval for a residential time of use metering. So as long as we are able to receive the data in a time of use format, um, we can accommodate even if the customer is, uh, is connected at low voltage. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, if I can just take this a little bit further um, uh, and, and uh, maybe ask one of the others. Um, uh, well, maybe uh, Anika, you're still the right person to answer this and that is, Okay, there's a relationship between an off taker and its municipality. There's an existing meter, which may not be a time of use meter. Uh, there's an existing billing arrangement and things will just carry on as normal as I understand it. Does that mean that the trader itself will have to, or, or the off taker will install another meter to which the trader has access? Uh, in other words, uh, will the trader then go and fit a time of use meter with data uh, handling capabilities and remote meter reading capabilities? Uh, uh, if there is, you know, no time of use meter with the municipality, but uh, they want to enter into this virtual trading, uh, where does the meter come from? Who provides that? Uh, and uh, can you answer that question, please? Yes, and this is another great uh, question, and we get that a lot uh, when we uh, present the, the, the William framework. So that is absolutely correct, Chris. Um, we do require the data in a time of use um, um, uh, um, template. Therefore, we would require that the, 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 the trader, between the trader and obviously the off taker within the municipality, they will decide. Um, how to then um, effect uh, that transaction and make sure that there is a time of use um, make measurement of the data for it to go into the platform uh, that will interface with the ESCOM platform. Thank you. Over to you, Lindsay. Well, uh, Chris, um, I, I did have a request from Africa Green Co. If uh, if they could clarify the, the platform question, and the CEO of Africa Green Co. has asked if she can say something briefly. So, uh, can I ask Johannes uh, if you would please just quickly clarify what you wanted to clarify on platforms, and then uh, Anna, will you step up, please? Yeah, I might maybe answer the same question, um, but I think <laughs> what we wanted to make 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 sure um, that it's clear that, for example, in our in our presentation, we focus so much on the system to showcase that it, traders need that internally to manage their risk to provide this value to the system because you need to, um, to track your exposure and you need to, therefore a good IT system internally. It's like like a bank also needs a proper IT system um, to to manage their risk. Our system is not uh, intending to do to become a platform um, or we want to create another market. I think, of course, we have trusted entities like SAP, ESCOM or, or other um, providers of marketplaces then 
that provide platforms and and we are really a market participant like other generators and ipps um that that trade on these markets provided by by the utilities or other uh, institutions so so i think that's something we wanted to 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 make clear that there is no mis misconception we do not want to create another market I think that, that was a good clarification. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, Anna, did, did you want to say something else or has Johannes covered what you wanted to cover? Are you still on, Anna? Nope, okay. Uh, in that case, um, let's see. Uh, there was a there, there was a question about the the ownership of uh, of traders. I think um, it's uh, it's helpful for for us to understand whether the the profits that these entities will generate will be expatriated out of Africa or will they stay within the countries and within the regions. Uh, let me ask uh, Aisha first, and uh, and then Johannes, and uh, and then Kaya. Very very briefly, please, uh, to expand on your ownership structures and where uh, where those profits are are likely to end up. All right, perfect. So, um, in terms of energy exchanges, um, shareholding, as we mentioned in our presentation, it's currently owned by Remgro and Rand Merchant Bank, um, both South African companies. Um, as you know, um, yeah, I'll I'll pass on to the next trader. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to also answer that quite briefly. Um, we are supported by impact investors, DFIs, and um, government-funded um, organization to really, um, yeah, facilitate this um, environment and to to attract more investment into into the sector. Thank you, and Kaya. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. We are in the process. We are in the middle of a process of B of a huge BE transaction, which I cannot disclose at this point. Um, but we are in the process of a, of a BE transaction, which we'll okay, see. Okay, thank you. We'll we'll watch this space. Thank, thank thanks, you. Kaya. Um, so it it Chris, it looks like Anna is not able to speak. So uh, so Johannes, I guess we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll take it that between you, you were able to resolve the uh, the point that you wanted to make. Chris, I, I know we're we're over time, but it, you're the boss of this show. How much longer do we have? <laughs> Look, the way I see this, uh, Lindsay, um, we are kind of out of time, but uh, you've done your wrap up, and I think we can go on a little longer, uh, as long as people are interested in staying on, we understand fully if people have to drop off, but there are still questions to be answered, and hands that are still up, and I would like to uh, uh, perhaps get through a few more. Of yeah. course, there's no way can handle all the questions it's just uh, a, a, a huge volume but uh, it, it, with your agreement everybody I'd like to suggest we carry on for another 10 minutes and then call it a day uh, and if I may uh, move to one of the hands up questions uh, I see one two three four five six uh, hands up uh, and if I may go to the top one which is David Serfrontein now David I know you as a nuclear man what do you have to say and what is your question uh, to uh, our presenters? I have allowed you to talk if you can switch on your microphone. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, my question is, especially if I listen to Onika's uh, presentation, government is, is working really hard to remove stumbling blocks for the willing and, and, and trading um, environment. My problem is that ESCOM in the past this decade operated without any effective competition and went basically bankrupt. And, and I know that, um, you know, uh, solar and wind can generate power much cheaper than new coal and, and, and new nuclear or new anything. Uh, so if, if government's going to go all the way and remove all the stumbling blocks, um, then solar and wind is going to bankrupt ESCOM. That's the way I understand it. So, and my understanding is that ESCOM is seen as immensely valuable by government and by the uh, ruling party and that they will not allow this to happen. And that at the last moment, they will think up some uh, obstacles to make sure that the full potential of solar and wind is not reached. That's my pessimistic view uh, after being in this industry for a long time, but I would like to ask the other people, do you see that this is real? Uh, is, is, is government just going to uh, uh, remove all the obstacles and allow full competition of ESCOM or not? 
No, thanks for that, uh, David. It's a very thought-provoking question. And I'd like to put it uh, to, first of all to, to Annika. I mean, Annika, Eskom is going ahead um, with this virtual platform. And David is suggesting that that's going to accelerate the demise of ESCOM. Uh, why are you doing this? Uh, I, I mean, I thought this uh, from your presentation, and maybe David misinterpreted this. This was to the benefit of ESCOM. It was to the benefit of municipalities. It was to the, uh, the benefit of customers and to the benefit of generators. Is David's view too pessimistic in your view, Annika? Uh, thank you, Chris, and um, it's an excellent question, in fact, from David. Um, and uh, I think just to, to explain, we don't believe that that is the case, um, because remember, Wheeling deals with the delivery of the energy. So as distributors, both ESCOM and municipalities, we are simply now just moving from an energy business to a wires business. So the, we, as long as the, the credits that are provided under a wheeling mechanism only deals with the, the, the avoided cost of energy. So let me make this easier. Distribution currently is buying from uh, the from transmission um, at a, a certain rate, the, the wholesale energy price rate. Simply what the, the virtual wheeling or wheeling in general does is that instead of that kilowatt hours being brought from transmission, they are now being provided by a private generator directly to an off taker. So in terms of ESCOM, what we do is we are avoiding the cost that we would have, um, as ESCOM distribution, I mean, we would have uh, paid transmission for this cost of the energy and now we are not paying transmission that cost and we're providing it um, as a credit to the to the to the generator because the energy is now being provided by the private generator. So as long as this um, uh, principle is based on an avoided cost um, mechanism, then we should remain revenue neutral as a distributor. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Is there anyone else uh, amongst the presenters who would like to pick up on this issue? Is this uh, the end of ESCOM uh, and, and uh, therefore why are they doing it? Well, and, uh, and in fact, is it not only the end of ESCOM, is it the end of other regional utilities as well? Yeah. If I could say in one thing, this, this is this is very good for the for the um, distribution side of ESCOM, but this will end up being horrible for the generation side of of ESCOM. If if nuclear and wind goes where I think it can go, it will kill coal and it will you know whatever, and it will kill new new anything new coal new new nuclear whatever, and governments very uh, strict that they don't want that. So so if this thing is going to be hugely successful it will have to be stopped or, or government will have to change its position and, and let, you know, ESCOM generation fall. I, I just don't see that. Can I, can I make a, can I just put my own little thoughts uh, here? And that is that currently ESCOM is unable to meet its demands, the demands on it in yeah. terms of generation. So uh, another party, uh, you know, uh, taking over this obligation is not hurting ESCOM. ESCOM is already unable to supply it and is actually looking for other generators uh, to, provide, uh, to provide this shortfall. And over time, we know there is no new ESCOM generation being built. Beyond Madupi and Kusili, there is nothing. And we are going, and they are going to decommission, you know, a good part of the coal fleet over the next decade or two. And there is nothing on, you know, allocated to ESCOM for new build. And we're going to need a lot more, a hell of a lot more. And the answer comes from diversifying the generation sector significantly. I personally see that ESCOM will morph from being primarily at the moment a generation business to in the future becoming primarily a transmission grid operator and a market operator, facilitating transactions across a very important state-owned grid 
between generators that could be the former ESCOM generators, uh, municipal generators, public-private part, uh, partnership generators, uh, a couple of hundred uh, uh, independent power producers, and literally hundreds of thousands of prosumers, people like you and me and small businesses, all generating, self-generating, as well as uh, for our own use, as well as into the grid. So uh, I, I just see personally uh, a, a future. I mean, there is no new generation build by ESCOM on the table. That is it. But the, the Minister and of Energy is, said it's coming I mean, off the grid. And uh, we need to fill that gap <laughs> big time. That's my view. The, the Minister so, of Energy said that the tenders go out um, in a few months for the nuclear. <clears throat> Doubt it, but anyway, um, I, Johannes, do you want to step in? Um, no, I, I think you have covered it well. I will support 100% what he's saying. I think um, that's that's also my view, our view. Any other presenters want to step in? I know this is controversial subject, but I, I've got no problem, you know, because I don't have any vested interests. I can, I can speak the truth as I see it. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Part, it's just... Carry on, sorry. I think it might it may be a biased view, but Parks shares the exact sentiments, Chris. You say the exact same sentiments as David, or the exact same sentiments no, 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 as me? No, as yeah. as you as you as you that the that uh, that, that Eskom will morph okay, into okay. A, into a, into a wires business. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's uh, move on, uh, David. I think that was a, a very interesting, a provocative, very thought-provoking question. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to another hands up. Uh, Felix Bornman has still got his hands up. Um, I don't know you, Felix, but perhaps you could tell us where you come from. And uh, I'm allowing you to talk now. Please switch on your mic. Are you there, Felix? If you can switch on. Ah, yes. Thank you. Uh, apologies, no, my hand wasn't up, but I've been loving this. So thank you very much. Okay, no problem. We'll move on to our next uh, one who's got a hand up. I'm just going to take this hand down. Jeez, uh, I'm getting confused here. Mpo Letsuale, uh, your hand is up. I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, please switch your microphone on, Mpo. Thank you. If you can tell us where you're from. Mpo, are you there? Please switch your microphone on, Mpo. Okay, Mpo's microphone is still off. I'll move on to Dave Long. Dave, are you there? I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, if you can switch on your microphone, Dave Long. Thank you. Testing, one, two, three. You got me, Chris? Yeah, 100%. All right. Two quick questions. One, does the Eskom virtual wheeling advance or retard the development of the under, unbundling of Eskom and the move to a freer open market. My sense is it's a retrogressive step because it's a delegating what Eskom I think should be doing as a central market. That's the first question. The second question is Eskom is playing a role in a uh, what otherwise would be a free market because they've launched the standard offer program and the emergency generation program. Uh, prices look as though they're substantially better than Megaflex. And Megaflex, of course, is one of the cornerstones of what the traders uh, use as a benchmark. Are the traders concerned about Eskom's role in the IPP market? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dave. Very interesting questions, too. Uh, I've also sort of asked the question mentally in my mind, you know, in the end state, if there is an electricity market, which is managed by the new Eskom uh, market operator, which is in the ITSMO, which will eventually become an independent transmission uh, a grid company and market operator, um, what is the role of a trader when there is a national electricity market. Uh, I'd like to put that uh, question to Aisha, if I may. Right. So, so Chris, maybe also answering part of Dave's question. Um, 
I think from a virtual wheeling perspective, and, and it's key to note that this is still under development um, and that the final product is not yet active um, for the market to participate in. But our understanding of virtual wheeling as it stands today is to also assist accessing low voltage customers or customers that sit inside of municipalities for various reasons. Um, and that's just currently the restricted access um, in accessing those types of customers, be it residential type customers or your smaller corner shop type customers. Um, so it's a tool that a trader or market participant can make use of to access those types of customers. So I do see it as, you could call it a blessing in a way, um, because as you know, from a trading perspective, we're currently focusing on your bigger corporates and industrials. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're ignoring the rest of the market. We would like to get to them um, at some point in the future. Um, in terms of Thank the you. second question Dave had mm -hmm. um, around the standard offer, um, Dave, I'm not sure if, if we're on the same page as this, but in terms of the standard offer that's currently out in the market, there are two prices on offer. Um, there's the static price and the dynamic price. In terms of the static price, which is given on a time of use basis, that's currently set below your wholesale price. Um, so from a trader's perspective, um, we'd much rather try and sell at the wholesale price as an example. Um, as opposed to take that static price. So we see it more as an emergency outlet um, in case we need to spill energy into the market um, in the future. Um, and then on the dynamic pricing side, it's a little bit trickier. Um, I guess you could get away with a higher price, but there is obviously risk in terms of that price fluctuating in the market. Um, I hope that provides some insight on those two topics. Thank you very much, Ayesha. And look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see a lot of hands up as we're not going to be able to cover them all today. Unfortunately, uh, we are already over time. We've extended the time by a further 10, 15 minutes, and we've still got lots of questions and lots of hands up. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, bring this to a close uh, and uh, say the following. Uh, I think uh, Lindsay has summarized things well. Uh, she has given us an overview of her own insights as well as um, summarized the uh, presentations by the individual pre presenters. Uh, we've had a, a lot of questions, uh, but we don't have enough time to provide all the answers. I have in the last uh, a week or two had several phone calls from very disturbed other traders saying, why were they not asked to participate in this webinar? And why only four? And the answer is simple. Uh, you know, we, we, we identified uh, four and, and because we can't have so many, we don't want to make this a whole day event. Uh, we think that there's a limit to how long people can sit in front of a computer. Uh, but I want to say that the level of interest has been such that we are going to be holding a second electricity trader webinar uh, in, in the latter half of October next month. Uh, and this will give more opportunity to more uh, traders to indicate their insights and not only to traders, but also to regulators and uh, developers. Uh, I'm talking about uh, people who develop platforms for traders uh, to make their voice heard. So this is not the end, uh, this is the beginning. And uh, it really depends on the level of interest that there is out there, but certainly the level of interest that we've had to this webinar has been uh, extremely high. Both from uh, people who have joined the webinar, as, uh, as I mentioned, we had 1,800, nearly 1,900 people uh, registered to attend, all of whom will get the presentations, all of whom will get a link to the video recording of this webinar. Uh, and then we're going to follow this up uh, next month and uh, we'll see how it, how it goes thereafter. Uh, so there's going to be still plenty of time to ask and get answers to your questions. It's been an absolute pleasure to host this event uh, with my colleague, uh, Lindsay Dyer. Uh, I'd like to thank Lindsay for her sterling efforts, her interest and what she's brought to the table. I'd like to thank all the presenters for uh, their fantastic presentations and the time they put in and the thought they've put in. And I'd like to thank the audience without whom we wouldn't have such a, a webinar. It's been great to engage with you and we look forward to seeing you again uh, uh, next month. Thanks and over and out.